right, all right, all right, lead heads. We're back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. And I want you to know I greatly appreciate you tuning in each and every week to catch the show. Hope you're enjoying the content that we've been putting out. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the last episode, 408, we had our good buddy Chad Enos on, and we talked motorcycles. We talked concealed carrying on your motorcycle. We talked having fun on your motorcycle. We talked about Sturgis. Chad just made a big trip to Sturgis. We talked about it a little bit. And they do, uh, he does some custom bike building. And he invited his friend Ted Blank on. And we talked a little bit about custom bike building also. So just kind of dipping our toes into the motorcycle topic, which I think uh, from the feedback that I've got from you, Leadheads, it's something that we're going to do another episode or two on in uh, upcoming episodes. If you want to chime in, there's something specific that you'd like us to talk about, shoot me an email, talkinglead at gmail.com. With, uh, if there's a specific motorcycle topic, there's a specific gun topic, there's a specific just topic in general that you'd like us to cover on here, maybe a special guest that you'd like us to have on, shoot me an email, talkinglead at gmail.com, and uh, we'll do our best to make that happen because we aim to please the Leadhead Brigade here. And we do that each and every week. Because of our amazing sponsors, so you lead heads, you listeners, you subscribers, you go out there and you show our sponsors love, and you do that by buying their products, you follow them on the social meds, you engage with them on their posts, you like their posts, you leave comments on the post, and that's how they know that the Leadhead Brigade really appreciates what they're doing to bring this show to you each and every week. And the giveaways that we do here, too. We do lots and lots of giveaways. Don't have anything today, but we do have some in upcoming episodes. Like that IWI Galil Ace that we're going to be giving away. IWI, sponsors of the Talking Lead AK Corner. We were going to give that away at NRA. And, of course, all you leadheads know that didn't happen. NRA was canceled. It was a bust due to the COVID Uh, complications that they were having there in Houston. And we were very disappointed about it. I was looking forward to seeing uh, some of you lead heads that were going to be there. And, of course, all of our buddies in the industry and all those interviews that we were going to do. We usually get tons and tons of interviews at these events. And, man, like the last three big ones have been canceled. This is the second year that NRA was canceled. Uh, SHOT Show was canceled this year. Uh, it's probably going to be canceled next year also cross our fingers. Let's, you know, hope this all gets straightened out before then, but, uh, who knows? So we've been coming up with other ways to bring you all the latest and greatest information from these firearms manufacturers, companies, gear companies, uh, that we normally, uh, get to talk about at these events. So, I'm in the process of doing that, the best way to organize it uh, and and bring it to you listeners. So that being said, this episode is going to be a blast from the past. I've reached back into the archives, and I was listening to this episode the other day, and I just thought, man, this is a, this was a really good episode. Plus, it would be a good episode to follow up on uh, to see where the uh, the topic that we were talking about in this episode brings us and of course that episode uh, was back in 2017 and it's when we were talking about the uh, military when they were going the army was going through their xm-17 modular handgun system competition and picking the gun that they were going to start issuing to their to the troops and of course we all know the outcome of that was the six hour p320 and we had some awesome guests on that show Former military guys, uh, people that had used the previous issued gun, the the Beretta 92FS, which was the M9, it had you know, been in service like 20 years. So we had several um, guys on from from several former military guys on for that show. Uh, John Peterson, Nate Love, Kenneth Hine, Casey Griggs. And um, just kind of getting everybody's input on the competition process that it went through. You know, was the competition ended prematurely? Was the best gun picked? So on and so forth. Because at the time, 
and we all know the P320 was going through, uh, you know, had some, some issues with the drop testing and whatnot. Uh, but since then, the government has put it through rigorous, rigorous, rigorous um, torture test, uh, troop testing, et cetera. SIG has made some improvements uh, on that to compensate for some of those uh, malfunctions that it was having. But yet, there's still a ton of lawsuits out there against SIG, the P320, and the majority of those coming from the law enforcement side. Now, there's a few, I think, civilian lawsuit cases out there. But as I was you know, kind of getting an update on, on where it was on this, I was just surprised to see just this. It just seemed to be just one after the other lawsuits against Sig Sauer and uh, seems to be more coming at each and every day. And I think that's got to do with the litigious nature of our society and – you know, lawyers, you know, typically when they see something, they jump on the bandwagon and, you know, they try to get in and get their piece of the litigation pie, so to speak. But it seems to be spurred by attorneys and lawyers, uh, these big firms that are going after uh, Sig Sauer. And it just seems like they're just trying to dig and dig and dig and find anything and everybody who's uh, had some sort of a a discharge. I think they're calling it an uncommanded discharge. Uh, of the gun, but, you know, listening to some of these people in their lawsuits and, you know, how the circumstances behind the, the gun going off and shooting them or whatever it did just seems a little suspicious and suspect to me, especially, you know, the law enforcement where, you know, that's grounds for termination right there. Uh, and probably, you know, even, even maybe, more stringent disciplinary actions, you know, could be taken. So, I mean, they have to try to blame the gun and not themselves. Uh, this one detective it was in her purse and it went off and he shot, she shot herself in her private parts in her butt. Uh, there was another guy um, in Florida, another police officer shot his knee. Uh, I mean, there's just, there's case after case after case. And I mean, yeah, there's probably something to it. But there's also a little suspicious sounding too. So I think I want to do an episode talking about maybe that also. Maybe not just the SIG, but you know, this is just kind of what's in the media right now. I guarantee you all the other gun manufacturers have lawsuits against them as well uh, with similar type uh, circumstances. So anyway, I thought this might be a good, uh, a good show to, to build interest in an upcoming episode of doing something like that. But it was episode 204, and the title of it was Did the Military Pick the Best Handgun? But we're going to play that this episode. So just kind of want to give you a little back history on why I chose to to re-release that. Plus, like I said, I'm gearing up um, because we're trying to reschedule all our NRA interviews that we had. And it's just been chaos trying to get everything worked out with everybody's schedule and, and whatnot. So... Those are coming. We'll have new episodes coming uh, regularly, just like you're used to. So don't fear. Never fear. This will give you time, you guys time maybe to get caught up if you're, uh, if you're lagging behind. Uh, and then also, for our new listeners who haven't had an opportunity to go back, this gives you an opportunity to uh, check out some of our past episodes and maybe go ahead and delve into the archives for more of our past uh, shows. We've got 10 years of Legicating the uneducated here, pumping out the education for 10 years since 2012 on talking lead here. But again, make sure you go and show all the love and support to our sponsors. Mission First Tactical, they just got hit with those storms and um, really put a monkey wrench in all their manufacturing and they've had to shut down and uh, they're you know doing their best to get everything up and going again. But go show them some love, Mission First Tactical, and buy their dump trays. You can get the custom Talking Lead logo, dump trays, uh, tactical wallets. The dump trays, we use them as armor trays, too. They're great for armor's trays. Um, but really good, uh, just multifunctional. They're Kydex, made out of the same stuff they make their holsters out of. Or you can get your own custom logo on there. They've got some pre-made things that you can pick from, logo things, but... 
we're working on getting our own talking lead page on Mission First, so that way you guys don't have to search around and try to find them or just tell them that you want one. Uh, they'll just have it there. You click on it, you can buy. You can buy the original Talking Lead logo, our Lead Head Brigade logo, our AK Corner logo. We're getting all that set up with Mission First. So um, that's coming. This damned old storm threw a monkey wrench in that too. Check them out, Mission First Tactical. Use the code LEADHEAD, and you're going to get 20% off any of their AR-15 accessories. They're cool 30-round AR mags. They've got AR-10 mags now. So go check them out. They've even got the window mags too. I'm holding one here. Not doing a video for this episode either, Leadhead. So don't go to YouTube, look for a video for this episode. And Seal One, Seal One, you go to sealone.com. Their uh, website used to be .net. The .net website is not uh, in service anymore. Uh, so go to the sealone.com website and you can go there and you can order all the CLP products that Seal One makes. It's a really good product, guys. Uh, I've been very impressed with. Um, the cleaning ability of it, the corrosive protection that it offers, and the fact that you do seal one and done. You put seal one on there, and it seals and cleans and protects it just like that. And this is a dry product. This is a dry cleaning product, guys. So you don't put it on and leave it on. You put it on, you leave it on for a little bit, and then you wipe it off. It's, it, it absorbs into the material and protects it. I had a post uh, the other day on Instagram. I was cleaning my granddad's M1 Grand um, stock. It had been in storage for I don't know how many years. We were going through and cleaning some stuff out of my grandma's house and ran across two of them. And um, I was like, wow, this is awesome. So it was really dirty and dusty. And I just broke out the Seal One paste and put it on a rag cleaned it off, wiped it on there, put a liberal amount on it, got it good and, and seal one up, and then I wiped it off, cleaned it off, and it looks great. I mean, it looks brand new almost. Did a really good job. But I did a post on that, and somebody left a comment that they had used it, and they were in the desert, and um, it had basically cemented their gun together. And <laughs> it's like... Uh, well, you know, if you cake it on there and you don't wipe it off, then you know anything you put on there wet in the desert is going to do that. It's just common sense. But it specifically states in their instructions that you put it on and you wipe it off completely. It's not a, a wet lube type product or protector. So I've got a little blurb, a little, uh, um, PSA message from Dwight that he goes through and he explains it. I'll pop that into this episode uh, and it, it explains it all. But seal1.com, use the code LEADHEAD, 25% off any of their products at Seal One. That's their aerosol, that's the paste, that's the liquid, that's the pre soaked um, bore pads that they've got. Uh, and they even got prepackaged like cleaning kits. It's got cloths and brushes and, and everything in that too. So uh, 25% off. Use the code LEADHEAD at SEAL1.com. How you doing? Dwight Suttle with SEAL1. Here to talk about the proper use and application of SEAL1 CLP+. The first time you use SEAL1 CLP+, ideally I would start with a clean firearm. One, you see how easy our product will go on and cover the entire firearm and then wipe off. And then you'll also see that our product will remove more carbon that has been left behind from whatever you've been using. Now it takes about three cleanings. I like to say clean shoot, clean shoot, clean shoot for the seal one to get in and fully penetrate the firearm and remove whatever else you've been using before. The seal one CLP plus is safe on all metals, plastics, composites, wood, leather, you name it, it is safe on there. The Seal One will not dry out. The Seal One CLP Plus is a dry lubricant. So you'll want to put it on and wipe it off. You want to wipe off the entire firearm. Seal One CLP Plus comes in a paste, a liquid, an aerosol, and pre-saturated bore patches that are bore specific sizes. We call those seal skins. To use Seal One, it's very simple. And using Seal One will 
reduce your cleaning time by over 50% from traditional cleaning methods. All carbon, copper, lead, plastic filing, and shotguns, nothing is sticking and adhering, so it all just gets wiped right off. So all you do is you field strip the firearm, you put it down, and you go piece by piece by piece with covering the entire firearm inside and out with the seal one. The first time you're using it, I would leave it on for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then you come back and you wipe it all off. Seal one CLP plus is very simple. You do not want to overthink it. It is a dry lubricant and is meant to be used as such. So you'll put it on the entire firearm inside and out, and then you wipe it off completely. That's all there is to it. Seal one and done. Thank you. And then Nemo Arms, they have a great line of firearms. They've got, they make pistols, they make rifles, they make shotguns, they make suppressors, and you can go and order parts from them also. Uh, just a great selection, great uh, quality firearms that they make there. They're shotguns. You've heard me say this. I've said it uh, several times on the show, and uh, it's true. Their shotguns are heirloom quality they're over under shotguns really nice they've got 20 gauge they got 12 gauge they got different links um but you may look at that price and you go wow but these things are really well made they're beautifully engraved the wood on them is gorgeous uh, but these are these are guns that you're going to pass down from generation to generation to generation they're just that that good that high quality so go check them out at NemoArms.com. And to help you out, they're going to give you Leadheads a little, little special discount. And this, is, this goes towards their firearms also. You can get 10% off if you use the code TL10 at Nemo Arms. And then for you guys who do want to live the Leadhead Brigade life, the Talking Lead lifestyle, you want to get our shirts, you go to 1776United.com. 1776 United has been producing our shirts from day one, and they are the most comfortable t-shirts that you will ever wrap around your body. Super soft, super lightweight, really good shirts. It's that tri-blend stuff. I don't know. But anyway, it's good stuff. 1776united.com. Use the code TALKINGLED. It's TALKINGLED, all one word. You get 20% off the Talking Lead shirts, the Leadhead Brigade shirts, our Leadhead Brigade patches that they have there as well, and uh, any of their stuff. Really use that code, and you can buy any of their stuff, their hats, their mugs. They've got a good selection of products over at 1776 United. And then for you AK aficionados who love the AK corner, you want to live that AK lifestyle, Factory 47, Factory 47 with a K, is where you want to go because they've got awesome AK apparel there. They've got the hats, they've got the shirts, they've got the hoodies, uh, they've got the tumblers, and we've got our AK Corner logo to apparel there, and he has it set up to where we've got our own page. So you can go there and you can get the AK Corner specific logoed T-shirts, hoodies, women's shirts, tumblers. It's all right there. F-A-K-T-O-R-Y 47.com. And they're also going to show you guys a little love. Use the code LEADHEAD. You're going to get 10% off at Factory 47. LEADHEAD gets you 10% off at Factory 47. And then, of course, Keltec, Keltec Weapons. They were going to sponsor us at the, uh, the SHOT Show or the NRA. They were going to sponsor us at the NRA, and it fell through. But we are in uh, discussions on how we might be able to still do something uh, with Keltec and maybe going down to Cocoa Beach and bringing the studio there, doing some live feeds, maybe do some giveaways and things like that. So uh, let me know what you guys think about that. Shoot me an email, talkinglet at gmail.com. And if we were to go, if we were to do a tour of the um, Keltec factory, what would you want me to 
to include in that interview, in that tour, if we do some live, if I do video, whatever that may be. And then we just, you know, and then we discussed with Chad on the last episode, if you didn't hear, uh, it was about motorcycles. And I uh, had some suggestions from you lead heads that maybe we do a, like a, a range and ride kind of thing. Maybe start one here in, um, in Nashville and maybe take it across the, take it across this great nation of ours where we get lead heads together at the range. We do a day at the range, shoot some Caltech weapons, that new P50, the KSG shotgun, uh, they're suppressed sub 2000 would be awesome. They're integrally suppressed sub 2000 that they've got out now. It's an awesome gun. I've shot it several times and then do a motorcycle ride or we do a ride in and everybody shoots and then we take our bikes out and we do a little tour or something but anyway kind of got the wheel spinning on that too so if you got ideas on that uh, shoot me email talking at gmail.com uh, and um, we can build upon that and make it great all right so that's enough of my ranting guys i'm gonna go ahead and spin up this blast from the past talking lead episode 204 did the military pick the best handgun for our troops? Question mark. All right, lead heads, welcome back to the Talking Lead podcast. This is episode 204, and we have got a very special show for you lead heads this week. And we're going to get into that in just one second. I just want to give a big thanks to uh, everybody that was on the show last week. Uh, I'd like to thank Tom from IWI, Chase from Zenith Firearms, and, of course, our host during that segment was High Threat Concealment, Adam Garrison, uh, which he was going to join us today, but unfortunately he wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to join us for this uh, special edition of Talking Lead that we're, we're having for episode 204. Let's go ahead and get into this show because this is probably going to be a pretty long show, but it's going to be very interesting. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So what we're going to be talking about today is the recent... Um, Army's decision for their new handgun. It's the, uh, was it the XM-17 project? Is that what they're calling it? Yep. Yep. So joining us on the call today, we have John Peterson, Nate Love, Mike McCarthy may be joining us a little bit later. He hasn't joined us yet. Uh, and then Casey Griggs is with us. And Nate, you've got um, Ken with you, right? Yeah, Ken Hine. Ken Hine. So what I want to do is I want to go around and everybody introduce yourself and um, uh, kind of qualify yourself for this discussion, which we're going to be talking about the modular handgun system competition, um, the previous handgun that the Army, the military had chosen uh, for their issue, uh, the current one that's been selected, and then the other ones that didn't get selected. And we're just going to kind of give our thoughts and perspective on the, the whole the whole thing. So. Let's start with uh, Casey. Everybody knows Casey Griggs, CG3G. Um, introduce yourself, Casey. What's going on? Well, uh, most of you know me as uh, Casey Griggs 3Gunner, sponsored by Nordic Components and Mossberg and a couple others, uh, uh, and Talking Lead. So kind of been in the military for 15 years, uh, going on 15 years, trying to finish 20, and uh, I'm an instructor now, so hopefully... And you've got some, some duty time, active duty. I got two years in Iraq, uh, 15 months, and then the second one was 12, so... Uh, one was in Balad and at Fabo Ryan. The second was at Camp Taji. And you've seen combat? Yes, yes. Yeah. And you were issued the Beretta, right? Beretta 92F, yeah. It was, it was, it's a different firearm, that's for sure. Right. We'll get into that. Okay, John, John Peterson, welcome to the Hi, show. How's it going? Going good, buddy. I'm uh, John Peterson. Uh, first time I touched a military pistol was in 1987. I was issued in 1911 when I was a machine gunner in the infantry. Later on, got in the Army Special Forces, and we were issued the 1911 and then the M9 all the way up through about 03, and I uh, capped off my time. Uh, I was in the Guard and Active Duty Special Forces, but I, cap I capped off my 20 years uh, with my final year, uh, part of that in Afghanistan on our, our deployment with our unit. And aside from that, uh, while in the Guard, I was an instructor at Smith & Wesson Academy and then SIGS, what's now called Six Hour Academy, so I had a chance to play around with and work with a lot of the other competing products that were going on and had a little bit of involvement with the R&D process for some of the military weapon systems and procurement. You know, I got to be a tester, not on this particular system we're going to be talking about, but some others. Okay, cool. Nate, Mr. Nate Love, Frontier Tactical, sponsors yep, of Talking Lead, by the way. 
<laughs> we are sponsors of your awesome, awesome show. Owner of Frontier Tactical, we do the multiple caliber system, the Warlock. Uh, so my background was I was 11 Bravo infantry in the Army uh, for about 10 years. Got out, went to Gunsmith College, and from there got picked up to be a small arms repairer and then the senior weapons inspector uh, over in Afghanistan and Iraq as well, and also through the U.S. Uh, so everything from <clears throat> unit level armor all the way up to depot stuff, uh, worked on every uh, weapon system that the military uses. So that includes all the pistols, all the SIGs, all the Glocks that were local procured, all the 1911s, all the M9 series. So pretty much the other side of the pistol. I was issued an M9 uh, Beretta series. Um, and then, and that was as an infantry guy and then worked on everything on the backside. So that's kind of my qualification. Okay. And Ken? Uh, my name's Ken Hine. Um, served 28 years in the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, started in 83, went all the way through to when I retired in 2011. Uh, so during my military service, served in combat during Desert Storm and then again in Iraq in 07, 08. Also served as a contractor in uh, Afghanistan from 2012 to 2014. Uh, during my service, I carried both the uh, 1911 and the, uh, uh, the Beretta 9 mil. As far as any other background in uh, arms, was I'm currently working with Frontier Tactical as a as an assistant to Nate Love so that we can work on expanding my knowledge in, uh, in weapons. Very good. Very good. And I guess Mike has not joined us yet. He is working through a Skype update. I think you called that one, Marty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll get him in um, when he joins us. We'll, we'll get his intro, but we'll go ahead and start. So what is the modular handgun system competition and uh, you know what initiated it i guess that's what we should talk about first so i've got a copy of the rfp thanks to john and kind of the page two of that i'm just going to read this i think it kind of breaks it down and explains it pretty good on, on what this process is so i'm going to read this real quick and that'll give uh mike some time to get in so it says the U.S. Army uh, Contracting Command, New Jersey, Pictini Arsenal, New Jersey, on behalf of the program manager, Soldier Weapons, has a requirement for the modular handgun system, MHS, for the purpose of this request for proposal, which is an RFP, and resulting contracts. The MHS will consist of the handguns, associated ammunition, and supporting accessories to include spare parts, Interested vendors will be required to supply all the items as described in Section B under the resulting contract. The acquisition strategy is to conduct a full and open competition that will utilize the trade-off method to evaluate and select the best value systems submitted that meets the MHS requirements as described in this RFP and attach purchase descriptions in accordance with the federal Acquisition Regulation, FAR Part 15. Uh, the MHS procurement is intended to be an open caliber competition, which means the choice of caliber is left to the discretion of the, uh, of the offerer. So the, the people competing, I guess, get to choose what caliber they want to, uh, to enter into the contest. Offerers are permitted to submit up to two proposals configured to the specific caliber it chooses for evaluation. If an offeror chooses to submit two proposals, their submissions must be uh, must each be chambered in a different cartridge of the offeror's choosing. In addition, each proposal must be submitted independently from each other. Each proposal will consist of either a two handgun solution, one full size, one compact, or one handgun solution that meets requirements for both a full size and compact weapon, plus the following ammunition: ball special purpose, and dummy drilled inert, DDI, as well as accessories to include spare parts. Offers will have 150 days from the issue date of the RFP. Each offer will be required to conduct a contractor product instruction training demonstration session to the government on the hardware and the manuals. 
and the government schedule those times. The government intends to award up to three firm fixed price, FFP, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts based on the results of the initial evaluation of the proposal submission by following the evaluation procedures contained in Section M of the RFP. The government will then make a final down selection to a single contractor by following the evaluation procedures contained in Section uh, I don't know, H or M, whatever. The period of performance of the base contracts will be 10 years for the handgun, accessories, and spares, and five years for the ammunition. I don't know that this goes on and helps us understand anything else, but that's that's pretty much what they're they're trying to accomplish with this MHS. Would you guys agree that that pretty much sums it up there? Yep. Okay. So yeah, the rest of the details get more boring and people fall asleep. But yeah, that's what it goes into. Right. So this RFP is 351 pages long. <laughs> that was that was page two of this request for proposal. And I mean, there's a lot more stuff in here. So that's basically what the the people submitting the guns uh, or their their firearms for consideration are expected. You know, that's what's expected out of them. So um, let's go to John. Do you know all the people that had offerings in this uh, competition? I've seen the list, but uh, I've been kind of more focused on the. Yeah. What's happening next, man? I don't, right. Well, I don't know if the, it's it's, it's the pretty much everybody much you good. would. Yeah, it's pretty much everybody you'd under you would uh, expect. Um, obviously, Sig, Glock, Smith yes. and Wesson, uh, Beretta uh, had an entrant, and I don't I don't know who else might have had. I'll, I'll get the full list for you though. Yeah, I mean, I had I had uh, a list of it, but those are the it's the main people that you would uh, expect. So. What the Army is currently using, I mean, obviously they're unhappy with their current issued firearm, the Beretta. Is it 92 92F? F? Yeah, 92F, which they call what? The M- M9 series. M9 series. M9 series. Yeah, yeah. The M9. So the new one is the, what do they call it, the 17 or something like that? Well, XM17 for now. Yeah, the XM17 right. for now. Most things are going to start out, especially in the weapons platforms, are going to start with an X until they're Experimental, adopted. right, yeah. They're testing them out. Right. Well, the other one, Tim, too, you, you probably wear is that the, the Beretta was actually approaching the end of its service life, you know, that it's anticipated to, uh, you know, that the gun's supposed to last. Um, and I know that in this RFP, it says, instead of 20 years, it says 10 years. Right. They've you made know, this one 10 years. So was yeah, might, was it previously 20 years? Is that what it, the agreement was? I believe so. But I, I remember reading specifically that Beretta... Um, was going to have to compete again anyways because they, you know, because they had already been coming up with new versions of the M9 uh, to compete, to recompete. Mm -hmm. And that, they, but they, they specific, the Army specifically put out that the Beretta M9 was reaching the end of its service life. Okay. So does anybody have any idea on um, the previous process that they had for, for choosing the service weapon? And Before you go into that process, I would probably uh, preface that with something that most people don't know, and that is that although the Beretta is the primary uh, DOD-wide service pistol, there are other service pistols used uh, just not as largely uh, with it within all of the military branches. So you have uh, the SIGs, there are 220 series, so the 220, 225s, 226s, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, there are smaller amounts of Glocks, there are uh, smaller amounts of other pistols like the 1911s that are uh, at, you know, less known units. They're not widely accepted throughout the military branches. Um, so, you know, you've got different units using different pistols, but basically military-wide, it is the Beretta M9 series. So, right. And this is the Army's selection process, and I think maybe the Marines may have signed on with it as well. Is that, that correct? It, that remains to be seen. Uh, a lot of that comes through the testing process and the different channels that they use to procure. Yeah. Um, because you, if but you just say because range, the army chooses this, it doesn't mean the air force necessarily is going to accept whatever guns picked or um, no. any of the other branches. Right. Not right. at all. Right. Okay. Well, I, you know, maybe something you guys probably knew as well, but uh, something that may have been a contributing factor in all this is, you know, because Nathan just mentioned the other issued pistols that. I know one of the most prevalent ones 
uh, at least numerically, was the M11, you know, which is a SIG P228. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, and those were getting issued. It's going back like 20 years now. But CID, right. you know, criminal investigators, and counterintelligence, and a few others were getting those. And I had a chance actually to train a couple units that that was their primary issued gun, uh, where our unit just provided some extra opportunity training and uh, for them, some protection guys that protect the, like, generals in the military. And they were pretty happy with the gun. Obviously, liked it better than the Beretta. But the reputation that that gun gained, not just in the Army, but the Air Force, OSI, and others had it, um, and, and a lot of the DOD entities, a lot of them, whether civilians that are issued guns, uh, were getting this gun. And then others started asking for it, you know, mm -hmm. as a concealment gun. And then, of course, a few years ago, they won the uh, upgrade to that, which I think is called the M11A1. Mm -hmm. you know, it was reported widely in the gun press. But that gun seemed to do pretty well. They only had to make a couple of changes to it. And, of course, now SIG... They put a stainless steel slide that's made in New Hampshire on that thing, which makes it even more durable for the field. But I know personally from teaching a number of people that were issued that gun, they were they were quite happy and they didn't want to give the thing up. So I that, absolutely love that. I, I was reading later, though, that and it was more rumor control, but that there were a lot of people reporting to the folks at Picatinny Arsenal, like, look, we're happy with the SIG that we've got. Uh, and, of course, the SEALs will tell you about what they feel about their SIGs. You know, so, and of course, that gun also ran, you know, they actually, the SIGs got a, an upgrade in the SEALs. You know, they switched from the older version, national stock number, to the new one with the stainless slide, which I ended up owning a copy of. I actually owned one of the test guns that were sent as one of five to the SEALs to test for mean rounds, be seen stoppages. And when I was an employee at SIG, they sold it to me. It's more as a, a yeah. novelty thing. I got but, one sitting right so back that, here by Casey on the on the desk. So maybe that the fact that they had such a good track record, not just with the other ones, Nathan issued, a lot of people don't realize the P220 and P225 and some others actually had NSNs, you know, stock numbers and were available for issue. But, uh, right. you know, they did have a good track record with the Navy Special Warfare Command and, I don't know, probably about six different places in the military I knew of were getting the M11s. Yeah. So. Well, let's talk about the, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the Beretta. And, I mean, obviously it was time for that, I guess, that contract to end. So, um, you know, the go government opened it up for uh, newer, modern guns and, you know, with their criteria that they were looking for. Um, you know, it had to be modular. Um, it had, they wanted it more lethal, um, which, you know, you would think that that meant a, a different caliber, but they went with the nine millimeter again. And, uh, I think it actually went with a shorter barrel too, with the, the SIG versus the, the Beretta. Yeah. The, there's a shorter barrel in that. Yeah. In the SIG. So, um, what other, what other criteria were, were they looking for? Do we have that? Well, John's absolutely correct with uh, all the other systems that were out there and who they were issued to. Uh, one of the things that is uh, an underlying factor, though, that doesn't always make it into the the written form, as we know, for the procurement process, is its acceptability of NATO calibers. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we have that requirement if we're going to continue working with NATO countries. Uh, so that ammunition requirement is uh, usually written directly into the proposals and RFPs that they put out, although it's not always directly stated. Well, so a lot of that ends up being, you know, uh, uh, dreaming or pie in the sky stuff when people start talking about changing calibers to things that may or may not be more lethal based on the testing criteria. So when you say, you know, 40 Smith & Wesson or 45 ACP, those are all great and desirable uh, over 9mm FMJ, but when you go out there into uh, NATO country ammunition stocks, you're not going to find a whole lot of that. You're going to find a lot of nine millimeter, you know, nine by 19, nine millimeter parabellum or Luger, whatever they're calling it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what's in the stock. And that's what we have to be able to, to use and share. Yeah. Well, plus is they, uh, one of the specs was that the gun had to be fire, be able to fire a newer authorized hollow point. Uh, I think they call it the XM. 1153 special purpose ammo that SIG developed that, mm -hmm. that was actually included in the contract that they'll be able to, the military will be able to obtain and use uh, that ammunition. That's something that wasn't too widely reported, but I think it's pretty significant. Right. I, I would agree with you heavily on that. Yeah, it's but then that, as we read through the, the RFP, it didn't say anything about hollow points. It said the three types were right. uh, the ball, the uh, inert, and uh, what was the other one? I can't remember. The dummy drilled. Yeah, that was the inert, and then there was another right. one. Like, then there was the purpose. Yeah, the special purpose one. That's the one that John. Okay, that's the special. Okay, yeah. so that would that would qualify for the hollow point special purpose. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Perfect. So before we get into you know the newer handgun, let's talk about the the older one and the reasons why it needed to be replaced. I mean, obviously, 
it, it didn't get good reviews throughout its its career. Um, and no. you guys have firsthand knowledge with that that firearm. So, what were some of the issues that you? We'll start off with the with the negatives, and then we'll talk about you know any pros because I think the negatives are going to outweigh the pros, the cons versus the pros. Well, one of the negatives Who's that I got first? about it, <laughs> one of the negatives that I have about it in Iraq in 0405, and I don't know when they come out with the new mags, but uh, was feeding issues. The springs would stick inside the magazines and cause a lot of jams uh, due to the sand. And, uh, you know, just it being an open top pistol, I mean, I know it, that sounds not significant in some things, but the the dirt, sand, grit, and everything would get down inside of it. And, and for us, it just caused issues, uh, especially when you're around like a lot of Bradleys and, and things of that nature, you know, any stuff that kicks up dust nonstop. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just some of the issues that we had with it. Was just I don't know many battlefield conditions that aren't going to have dirt. So, I mean, you think that would have been something that they would have tried to have tested beforehand. Well, the dirt in Iraq tends to turn to uh, <laughs> solid concrete right. when it gets wet and then dries. Yeah. So. you got to remember when we, had, when we changed over, too. At that time, we weren't really in the desert. You know, it was, you know, right. we were still wearing woodland camouflage, so we were thinking <laughs> yeah. about being in the woods. Exactly. Yeah, I remember, I remember uh, wearing the wonderful DCU with the woodland camo mix in the middle <laughs> yeah, of Iraq. Yeah, chocolate chips. <laughs> I had those two. Well, Marty, I got ten. I got ten reasons that I've been seething over since I got issued one of these for the first time. It's like a list right, of ten growing. And uh, this was going to be in my article, but I give it to you. One is that decocker and manual safety lever on the slide is all wrong, and almost every police department in the company country abandoned that idea. And every company that makes that ended up offering later a modification where when you actuate it it actually pops back up you know it's a spring-loaded manual safety lever right smith and wesson beretta everyone but the troops got left out you know the troops get stuck with a gun that when you go to rack the slide like for a stoppage you can actually dead man the gun by accidentally pushing that lever down um and later on in the special forces we were allowed to keep that lever up we did not have to have it down being used as a manual safety lever we were allowed to keep it up so you basically had you know a, a double action first round without having to flick a switch but the second one was that traditional double action, you know, double single. Uh, a lot of us feels obsolete. I had to teach on those guns for six years at two companies. Plus, for, you know, be an issue the thing over 15. But it's it's really just too hard to learn. And a lot of the troops just aren't given the time to train on learning that specific trigger system. That I believe it was the Germans uh, invented with the P38, you know, the old German uh, P38 pistol. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just it's too much training. It's too much to deal with. And the nice thing about the, the CP2320 SIG you know, the Mark, uh, well, I guess it'll be called the M17, but, you know, as you got one same pole every single time, the uh, the top of the slide on the Beretta is not beefy enough to really get good purchase with your hand if you got a racket or you got a stoppage. It's got, in fact, it's hard to rack the thing because it's got a rounded top to it. You know, the Italians do nice at making artsy-looking and peculiar-looking guns. I mean, you know, Pietro Beretta is 600 years old or something, but that's we need something that when you're wearing gloves or you're in the field, you can just grab it and rack it. Yeah. Uh, the other one is, I think one of the other guys mentioned that open top slide, you know, exposed the barrel to not only rust and grime, but I know almost every single day we're in Afghanistan, we had to take these things apart and wipe them out. Um, unless you carried it in one of those transportation pouch holsters that the military issued, that UM-84 Bianchi holster, which I don't think anybody was using by the time the war started. But mm -hmm. the other problem with that bread is those magazines are probably the most rustable magazines I've seen in my career. I mean, those things were just... I've seen where they got stuck in the gun and would not come out uh, yep. and be in the field. And, of course, you may have heard that for years the Berettas began uh, developing problems with crack locking blocks, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is a design feature they took from the, the German P-38, that, that that lowering and rising locking block, the ears of it would shear. Some slides were cracking, and we had broken barrels. Now, I never had any of these happen except for once I saw a broken uh, locking block, uh, and that was after going through a 5,000-round shooting course. Um, but uh, another bad sign that we saw was a lot of guys were not buying this gun off duty. When we started getting it issued in 1990, 91, almost nobody was buying Berettas to shoot off duty. We were all buying other types of guns, you know, to do our off duty training. And that's a bad sign. A lot of troops buy 1911s. Like when we had the 1911, a lot of guys owned them because you might as well try to get good at what you're issued. Uh, so my prediction is, and, and of course, hoping that the SIG goes forward. That once this thing gets issued and guys start to like it, they're also going to want to buy it to practice with or carry, you know, off duty. And then the final thing with that darn Beretta is the you can't remove the front sight. It's a fixed sight. You know, it's fixed into milled into the frame. There's no way to take that thing out of there. 
Um, and that, that is especially a problem when you try to put a suppressor on the gun. You cannot use most suppressors with the military-issued M9 pistol unless it's got, I think there was one that we were given that had sight, a sight on the suppressor, you say. Mm -hmm. And it, and it actually had a, a locking feature that reached back and it would lock the slide and battery. So you had a completely, almost completely suppressed shot. You know, it wouldn't allow the slide to cycle. But uh, and now only a few people got issued that thing and some pilots and stuff. But so there's my top 10 list. <laughs> I'm sure there's more, but those were the gripes that we had. And we tried reporting those to the folks at Picatinny Arsenal uh, and, and to, it fell on deaf ears. You know, I was we thinking told, that nope, this is the this is the handgun platform system that we will have for the foreseeable future. See you later. I was thinking that Beretta oh. was going to try to remanufacture the front sight, but I never heard any more on that. Well, they did, and for the recompete, they did have a candidate, and, and I know that the Army Marksmanship Unit at Fort Benning had done all manner of modifying Berettas to make them shootable. <laughs> definitely. Or, you definitely. Know, uh, <laughs> you know, those, and I, I actually went through some training, and, and Special Forces training, with a guy who had actually worked at the AMTU down there and was a gunsmith uh, for them. So I got an earful about how great the Beretta was, but that's only because they had the latitude that the rest of the Army didn't have, which was to fix it. But I think a major turning point was around 2001, and everybody was getting more focused towards CQB and counterterrorism, and, and they wanted to be able to put lights and stuff on these guns and suppressors, and it's just hard to, it's kind of hard to do. We had those giant Surefire P60s, those giant contraptions that you stick on a Beretta, but we had no holsters to put them in, you know? <laughs> well, I believe um, that whole Oh, uh, this is now. I believe that whole playing field is fixing to change from between the Beretta and the SIG because uh, one of the guys that uh, that I happen to know that shoots the Bianchi Cup got to shoot, I believe, with the new SIG uh, X. Is that right? Am I saying that right? The new uh, 21 X. round. I don't know. It's their new competition version they've got out. Yeah. And uh, he he I, he loved it. <laughs> so And he still loves that pistol. So, Nate, talk about your experience with the Beretta. <clears throat> so... John did a great job of going down his top 10 list of major failures with the M9 series platform. Um, I will add to that. Uh, he did mention about the locking blocks already um, and the slides cracking as well. Uh, what, what the military did on the back end on the maintenance side of things is they, imp they usually implement what are called modification work orders. Um, it's essentially, well, modification work order or MW, MWOs cover a large area. They can be anything from, uh, you know, new additional things that they want to add and integrate into an existing platform, or it can be the, uh, it can be the equivalent of a recall, uh, which is not called a recall. It's called a, we're going to fix this stuff quietly and call it a modification. Work order. Uh, the locking blocks, uh, were a number one source of some of the MWOs that went into the M9 series. Um, also, one of the MWOs that came out was with the M9A1, which did incorporate that rail that John was getting into with uh, having the added lights. And we all know, you know, the Picatinny rail is the greatest thing to happen to the AR-15 since, you know, anything. So they wanted to integrate that into the service pistol as well. Um, some of the problems with those MWOs is they didn't address uh, the perfect storm of events that happens when you introduce Joe into the mix or the soldier. Uh, which is they like to do things that are above their level of maintenance and or modification. So we started to see things over there uh, that were user caused, such as local purchase of laser grips. So they would purchase uh, <laughs> grips and trace and other laser grips. They would remove theirs. They would lose a spring, and I think you know which one it is. Then they would put those grips on and have a malfunctioning pistol. Uh, they would also purchase either locally through their unit or themselves from eBay or Amazon or wherever, a certain holster that starts with S and ends in ERPA, which were not authorized. Um, the M12 uh, is a flap holster similar to the one that John was talking about. It's the green, ugly nylon one that none of the soldiers wanted to carry. Um, so they would get issued those. Those would invariably find their way into a Connex somewhere and not be used. There would be a 55-gallon drum full of them. And everybody would be running around with cool guy drop leg holsters that caused numerous problems with the wear of the pistol, which was already uh, kind of light on finish to begin with, uh, which overseas when you're in any kind of a marine environment, which the Middle East is full of marine environments, even when you think you're in the desert, you just happen to be a couple hundred miles from the, the coast there, that marine environment finds its way to you in the form of salt deposits. So we had a lot of corrosion issues over there. We had a lot of cleanliness issues, which 
kind of exacerbated the corrosion as well. And then you got a lot of holster rash from unauthorized duty pistol holsters that you know, everyone's running around with because they saw it on, in Hollywood. Uh, the, the M9 is also the exact same pistol that you see in, or, well, a copy of that, uh, that you see in Lethal Weapon 4 where Jet Li pulls the slide off. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, <laughs> that scene. Yeah, right. That is the pistol they used for that. Hollywood's actually pretty happy with the 92. They put that. They well, used it in uh, all the the Lethal Weapon movie. Remember he shot right. the smiley face? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that happens to be the one that you can literally, and I've done it before to show people, mag, you know, loaded, round in the chamber, pull the slide right off. Uh, that happens to be the pistol that you can do that with. Um, but when you get into the, the maintenance side and all the moving parts that make up the M9, he was dead accurate when he's talking about uh, that manual safety decocker system. Um, it's locking block mechanism, uh, slides, cracking magazines, uh, freezing inside of the mag well due to either corrosion or expansion. It, it, it was probably one of the most maintained weapons when it came to repairs and replaces. Uh, it, it literally was, um, the prima donna of maintenance. It took a lot of time, more time than many of the other weapons platforms that we had to service. Yeah. So, you know, that's another consideration, you know, as far as cost goes, you know, the cost of ownership, the maintenance, where one, you know, they may be coming in cheaper, but in the long run, it may cost more to maintain that, that firearm. It's absolutely correct. And a lot of what goes into the bidding process is uh, life cycle management. Uh, when you start talking about, you know, how many years down the road are we going to be able to procure magwell bodies and springs and followers, et cetera? You know, and do we get them from the manufacturer? Are they subcontract? You know, how is this procurement process for the entire life cycle of this weapons platform that we decide on? And then a lot of that goes into how that's why you end up with a 351 page MW uh, MHS RFP. Uh, yeah, RFP. I mean, that's there's so many things that get written into it and they probably don't even cover it all in the first one. So wait for that second one to come out. <laughs> Ken, talk yes. about t- talk about your experience. Just just to add, and really, as far as what everything else that's been discussed already, the one the one thing that I really dislike the most, is, and, and because I'm showing my age a little, I, I was issued a 1911, and so uh, transitioning from the 1911 to the to the Beretta. Probably the biggest difficulty I had was getting used to the trigger, and and going from going to a a double action trigger. And the one thing that I'd say that I disliked the most about it was not the fact that it was a double action because I actually kind of like that. Uh, but after the first shot, uh, there was a lot of take up uh, to uh, to fire off the next shot, and until you got used to that take up to fire off the next shot it's it took you a lot longer to get that second shot off and that was probably the biggest thing that i disliked about it i mean i did carry it for a number of years especially once i made it to senior rank e7 and above uh that was primarily my issued uh weapon but it wasn't my weapon of choice i still i still carried my ar uh especially when i was outside the wire and i was running in convoys i didn't want that to be my primary weapon my primary weapon was the m4 but it was the weapon i was issued with and the one that i qualified with so i had some experience with it but it it didn't mean that i liked it i just got used to it and and there's no end of jokes about how uh yeah you know you've got a 15 round magazine but it's very likely that you're just going to throw the pistol (laughs) you know as a form of distraction to get to your rifle well, you know, and that was going to be kind of my question to you guys also is, you know, the pistol is not your primary weapon to begin with. I mean, obviously, yeah, you want a reliable backup but when you have to go to that. Who who uses this as primary? Any Anybody in the military use the pistol as the primary? Yes. Um, the There's a number of them. Uh, I, I, interesting, I got to train all these folks when I worked at those two different companies because, you know, they would all send their instructor types through. Mm-hmm. But you've got the uh, military CID, who are both, there's uniform and civilian, you know, yep. within DOD. Uh, they have, uh, you've got like organizations like NCIS, uh, you know, in the Navy, mm-hmm. uh, the OSI and the Air Force. Army has CID as well as 
Marine Corps. Then you've got the counterintelligence folks who are in all the armed forces. And most, I believe, are still issued the SIG. Uh, they call it the M11A1 now, but it's, you know, it's a PT-28 with a stainless slide. Mm-hmm. Um, the, obviously, the military police, in most cases, that's you know, their sidearm is their pistol's primary weapon. Uh, and then you've got some other nitnoid people who get it, but uh, as a primary gun, you know, uh, specialized type thing. But, you know, mainly the plainclothes types, right. as well as the MPs. The plainclothes of people who aren't in combat, right? It's something you're seeing a lot more of, and this is, again, somebody mentioned this earlier, but you're seeing a lot more units, especially special operations, are issuing the pistols. There are certain types of operations where the pistol, whether it's plainclothes, whatever, is the primary weapon. Or for off-duty, like when, for, for instance, I know a couple of times we went to South America and elsewhere, we, we had pistols, well, we're on duty 24-7, but I mean, when we were off-duty going into town to get gas or supplies, we would carry concealed uh, and had holsters, which, of course, we had to buy out of pocket because the military wasn't issuing one uh, for us at the time for the, for the Beretta, that is, the M9. So, yeah, there are, you're seeing more of an increase in the number of people who have a pistol as a sidearm these days, especially for mm-hmm. intelligence personnel. And especially, for every troop, especially troop civil get, affairs, too. Uh, you know, I forgot about that. That's right. And they, but you, what you're also seeing more of now is the, particularly with intelligence and also with contractors, you know, this, for every troop, there can be anywhere from one to five contractors overseas. And I know in a couple of the jobs I was in, I was actually issued the Beretta, uh, the 226, the M11, all these, but, with this pistol contract, you're probably going to see a large number of those contractors getting these pistols as well as a primary duty weapon while they're in the war zones. Okay. Right. A lot of the, a lot of what dictates the primary weapon is going to come down to what your job is. And I sure. think John touched on that really well, you know, because a machine gunner is going to have a primary weapon of a machine gun. Right. But then, and that's my point. The majority of the people that are getting issued these have a, a an other primary weapon. Well, as John mentioned, yeah, that pistol yeah. will be likely their primary, depending on you know, obviously the combat arms are going to stick to you know the heavier weapons, whereas the mm. the the lighter, the softer jobs, so to speak, um, you know, you got civil affairs people running out there in town trying to win hearts and minds. If if they're running around with a M16 in someone's face, they're not as adaptable. Right. To yeah, and I get that. I mean, I understand, but I'm saying the majority of the people that are going to be issued this are going to have another primary weapon. This will be their secondary. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Okay. That's the point I wanted to, to make. Yep. All right. So let's talk about real quick uh, pros. Any pros of the, the Beretta? I'll let whoever wants to start on that. Crickets. Um, okay, don't everybody talk <laughs> once. Crickets, crickets, well, crickets. <laughs> since I was the one who dropped the big list of 10 things that were wrong with the M9, uh, the two things I noticed from training a lot of people on it that, that were positives that most people uh, came back with, you know, thumbs up. And particularly because you do have your diehards that like that gun. Um, but the two things that I noticed is a lot of people felt that it, it shot really smoothly. It was a, it was pretty easy to shoot that gun. Once you get past that double action trigger, you know, the gun eventually will go off. And uh, but once you get to those other 14 shots that are single action, you know, it does shoot very fast. There's a pretty short reset on the single action. But a lot of guys felt that it was a good, smooth shooting gun. And I noticed that, too. And honestly, and also for many people, it's it, not all, but it seemed to point well. You know, that, and unfortunately, though, a lot of these people, this is the first pistol they've ever been issued in their life. And for many, they've ever shot. Mm-hmm. So I would preface all this by saying when you have people saying, oh, my gosh, we love the M9. Or, you know, I love having the Beretta issued. And one is you want to ask them how many people they shot with it or how much training they even had. Because a lot of them, the only exceptions I've seen that were experienced people were people that worked in some of our special forces schools and so forth, where they got to shoot that gun a lot, and they naturally are going to get good at any gun they get, mm-hmm. you see. Right. So they're a little bit biased, I think, you know, and, and, and one's a pretty well-known instructor and competition shooter, but, you know, I, and unfortunately those people influenced the process of when this contract originally came up for bid, and I, I just think that, that, that there were too many things with the gun before that were negatives and not enough positives. Mm-hmm. Right. I've got, so I got some positives, too. Okay. Go, Nate. Uh, so one positive that it, definitely has over some of the other platforms is that it does have 15 rounds in the magazine. Um, and if you're going to be shooting nine millimeter full metal jacket, um, what, no matter what gun it's coming out of having more rounds is a positive thing. Um, and as John mentioned, it's extremely easy to qualify with for what it was intended to do its job, which is to hit a man sized target at about 50 feet. It does that. It doesn't take much to, 
get someone to the point where they can qualify with that pistol to get it to do what it's supposed to do. So it does have that. Um, and also, even with the number of people who were putting laser grips on it and not being authorized to do so, uh, we did find that that laser is a universal language when it comes to if you put it on someone's chest, suddenly you have their attention, uh, which we didn't have with some of the local nationals we were working with before. Uh, they were used to having guns waved in their face. The moment that you have a laser on their chest, that changed the dynamic, and they started listening. Well, it's just like Iraq. You know, you could you could point a rifle or point a twenty five millimeter cannon in their face, and they, they didn't care. But the second you drew that handgun, it meant business. Right. No, you're serious. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I I had a pair of uh, CTC laser grips. It was the second gen that they came out that had the. Uh, I don't know if you guys recall, but they went through several versions of them, but. They actually gave me uh, two sets of them. One was on a blue dummy gun for teaching purposes, but with the laser. But I actually, for the whole seven months in Afghanistan, carried, didn't shoot anybody with a pistol, but as one of the guys was just saying, that laser is a very powerful tool, especially when you're arresting somebody and flex cuffing them. You can put the other, the cover man can put that dot on the ground next to the guy's head while they're looking sideways. They, and they all know because they've probably all seen one movie with a laser in it. Um, but also for scaring people off from our front gate at night in our base, like cars would come creeping up on our base and that we weren't issued the lasers that now they have. They have visible green lasers and some other modules Dazzler. Like for the M4, but I, I was the only guy in the team that had any kind of laser that was visible. So I would go out and literally use that thing to scare people off that were creeping up on our facility at night. But the, <laughs> I know for when you're doing arrest and cover, cover contact type situations, that, that does get their attention, especially yeah. if you swirl it around on the ground next to them while they're being cuffed. So after you listen to everybody's uh, pros and cons there, obviously the, the cons outweighed the pros on this and all valid reasons to why they needed to go to another, another platform for their issued pistols. Uh, John sent me a list here of the competitors that were in this MH, MHS uh, competition, and there were 12 pistols entered into the competition. Beretta entered their APX striker-fired pistol, has anybody got any um, experience with the APX? I don't have any experience no. with it. No, I, I've actually seen one. I've uh, seen it, but I've not actually shot it's it. It's pretty slick. I haven't shot it. I haven't shot it yet, but it's got some very aggressive serrations on it. I, I just that. don't know with it being so new. You know, you don't know the quality of it or yeah. anything yet. It hasn't it hasn't been battle tested, so to speak. So the Czech Republic had the CZ P09. Belgium had the FN Herzl. Uh, they had a polymer frame striker fire pistol. Uh, apparently based on the FN, FNS, and from which the FN 509 was developed. And then, of course, Glock had the 17 and the 22, chambered in 9mm, and the 40 Smith & Wesson. So they submitted, I guess, two different calibers. Um, Chris USA, uh, their Sphinx SDP. I've actually shot the Sphinx. It's chambered in 9mm NATO. Has anybody else had any experience with the Sphinx? No? Mm-mm. Okay. Uh, and then Six Hour had the P320, and it's their modified version of the P320. And then Smith & Wesson, m and General Dynamics Ordnance and Tactical Systems, STI, and Detonics Defense, STX. I'm surprised STI didn't get a good look, but I'm sure they did, just because of the competition shooters. Yep. Right. So, Marty, I actually know the, actually know the owners of Detonics. Yeah, I was going to really ask, like has I, anybody got any familiar, familiarity with them? What, what are they about? Yeah, I, they, what happens is you probably know Daytonics died for years, and uh, a couple of people from Illinois uh, who are instructors uh, uh, bought the name, the Daytonics brand. And I know when I started asking them about this, they were, you know, these are my personal friends, and they were very tight lipped. Long story short, I could certainly, now that this is over with conceivably, I could probably ask them if you like what, what actually happened or what they thought about the contest. You know, or the competition. Yeah, so, it's so a small we, company. I, I wasn't sure how they were going to be able to tool up for a contract this big. When I saw their name on the list, actually a couple of these companies, I was wondering if they did get a water, how are they going to, you know, produce that many pistols that fast to meet to meet the military uh, two hundred eighty thousand full size and seven thousand subcompacts. Yeah, you know, in in, in a well, year. That's another trip, thing you know? that they that should be in their their consideration process is like, okay, you got Glock. And Sig and Smith and Wesson, who have been around for you know many, 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 many years, and have produced many, many, many thousands of, of firearms, and, and have the capability of doing high um, volume. And then you look at a smaller company like the Detonics is like that would be a concern for me. You know, whether they had the best gun or not, whether they would be able to 
ramp up their production to meet it. And if they did have to do so, what's going to happen to the quality at that point? That's kind of like STI. You know, there's so many competition shooters and stuff like that that use STI. I mean, if they had to ramp up the production, would you get the same quality that you get now in their 2011 series firearms? Probably not. Yeah. It takes forever to get one now. That would be a concern of mine. And I don't know that the government really looks at that or not, but I mean, it may be a, a consideration. I can tell you from the manufacturing side and the government contract side, because that's something that we are definitely plugged into with what we do. Right. So you've got um, some experience with that. Yeah. Right. So that is actually part of the contracting um, is your capability statement. So when you put out there that you can do this, you also have to justify and quantify how you're going to do it and prove that. You can't just say, oh, we'll just ramp up. Okay, well, what are your capabilities for ramping up? They want to see that. You can't just make it up. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, also, also something that's glossed over a lot is how much of, uh, when it comes to the larger manufacturers that are out there, how much they're actually making in-house versus what they're farming out. So if you think that they're making all of their own pins and springs nope. and things like that, that's not always the case. Uh, so just keeping that in mind that, you know, just because they are a large manufacturer doesn't mean that they make everything themselves. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about the yeah, first. I, oh, sorry. No, did you have something to add? Go ahead. Yeah, I just just to back up what Nathan said, when I worked at Smith & Wesson, I, I was an instructor, so I actually worked in a, a building about two miles away from where the factory was, but I was over there all the time, I around a lot, and I was amazed uh, seeing in that company as big as they, you know, they used to be one of the two biggest handgun manufacturers, not only the capability they had to make a lot of pistols, which was, I was my personal favorite, one of them was that Smith & Wesson would win this contract, just knowing that they could conceivably ramp up to produce a lot of product quickly, but the other thing I noticed there is, and of course, I had to sign a statement saying I wouldn't say with the names of them all, but you'd be surprised at how many other companies send their products, like some of their parts, to Smith for finishing, heat treatment, and so forth done, or they actually buy entire end items from them that have their name on it. And it was, I'm right. talking rifle actions and everything. I mean, this is a pistol company. I'd walk through manufacturing and see all kinds of other stuff being built. You know, as, as you know, a lot of the AR-15s on the market now are or parts guns, you know, built out of several other companies' parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Right. That's something I've noticed de getting deeper into the competition myself and then shooting three gun. You, <laughs> the deeper you dig, the more you find out that you didn't know about firearms and manufacturers. Yeah. One thing I'd learned working at Smith and Sig is that with the exception of Glock and maybe some other companies, most of them outsource their polymer frames. Right. Um, you know, and I've actually, stood there at receiving in Smith and Wesson and watched these giant bins full of what looked like plastic toys coming off of the of the rough and had burrs on them. And they, you know, of course they put them through a process and, uh, before they even get near being assembled. But and most of them do that now. They, I, I don't know for a fact what SIG's doing with the 320 military variant, but I do know that they buy these literally from plastics manufacturers, yeah. um, that make this stuff polymer, you know? So that's good that they do take that into consideration as far as a company's capability. So that was, uh, I was curious right. about that. So let's talk about the first phase, what's involved in the first phase of the MHS uh, proposal. So the first phase was a uh, bid sample testing described in Section M of the RFP, which was to be conducted on all MHS proposals to identify which of them did not meet the basic requirements of the RFP and rank the proposals that were found to be in competitive range. Phase one consisted of only limited testing based on nine factors, included test firing the pistols for accuracy solely in a ransom rest and test firing the pistols only 12,500 rounds for reliability and only 500 rounds for compact pistols, all in a test firing fixture. The only time the soldiers fired the MHS candidate pistols during the initial testing was to evaluate the ergonomic aspects of the pistols and complete a written survey of their opinions. Once this initial phase one testing had been completed, up to three MHS proposals in the competitive range were to continue on to the sustainability, uh, more comprehensive phase two, product verification testing and down select evaluation based on six factors as required by Section H of the RFP. At the conclusion of the initial phase one testing, proposals from Glock and SIG were the only two in the competitive range. So I guess all, was there 12 in all? So 10, 10 of those flunked out of the phase one? It says both proposals were ranked essentially equal based on the limited testing of the technical factors evaluated during that phase, such as reliability and accuracy. 
The first phase of initial testing was not designed to identify which pistol would be able to perform best under the conditions soldiers would actually encounter in combat. The results of this initial testing were never intended to be the basis of which to select the actual pistol that would be adopted, and they are not sufficient for that purpose, which I wouldn't think so either. And that, that's what phase two is supposed to, uh, to get more into. And it's my understanding that these uh, firearms never made it to phase two. Um, so let's talk about phase two real quick. Phase two of the testing required by the RFP was a comprehensive product verification testing and down select evaluation based on six factors to be conducted on a competitive basis to determine which of the two MHS pistols in the competitive range was technically superior. The results of this crucial and universal small arms testing process is what the RFP intended to enable the source selection authority to make a fully informed decision regarding which MHS proposal was technically superior and should be adopted by the Army. Testing that was supposed to be done in a competitive basis during the second phase of the testing included system accuracy shooter in the loop. The only time in which the pistols were actually to be fired in soldiers' hands for purposes of measuring their accuracy. Reliability and service life testing was also to be conducted based on firing up to 35,000 rounds. Sustainability more than the limited number of rounds that had been fired with the pistols in a testing fixture to measure initial reliability during the limited first phase of testing. The RFP uh, identified accuracy, reliability, and service life as the most important factors to be evaluated in the second phase. So, and it's it's my understanding again that um, these the Glock and the the Sig didn't make it to phase two. Does anybody have any any comments, any knowledge of that? So what? what so in phase one, did they just do the decocker and safety and all that stuff that they were talking about doing? Phase one was basically they just had it in a um, a fixture, just a, a, a machine, yeah, a machine that holds it, and they just ran 12,500 okay. rounds through it. So that would have been phase two. Now, <clears throat> Phase two if, would have been the actual individual soldier or person using it, shooting up right. to 35,000 rounds through So it. that's the article that I read was the selection process, and they had a few things they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And But shortly after that is when it went black. I seen nothing else. It disappeared. And next thing you know, SIG's got the contract. <laughs> so anybody else got anything different? Well, I know that's the part where... They actually had, it was 135 troops from all the different services had to fire it because I think they even include the Coast Guard in this, believe it or not. Um, but they all got a chance to, but I've, see, I've taken part in that type of testing before, not with the handgun, but with other products. And they, you're pretty much sworn to silence when you take part in those um, about, especially how the process is done to make it fair on other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. it, it can actually be considered procurement fraud and you, they actually watch you for that. Uh, so my point is, is, um, that from that point, I know those 135 troops plus probably hundreds of people involved in the testing. Uh, I know in the when years ago when they tried the first time around to adopt a new pistol, there were all kinds of people leaking out information and industry folks and insiders and gun writers, and that really spoils the process and makes it unfair. Um, you know, look what happened to Beretta. I don't know of anybody that was involved in that picking that gun. You know, it was That's picked true. for us. That's but true. it yeah. does appear to me that this was a lot more fair than before, at least. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I agree 100% with what you said, you know, because you start leaking information, people are going to try to start going behind their backs and, oh, hey, we need to make a correction here, we need to make a correction here. Well, the firearm that you submitted should have been good to begin with. Yeah, so the, right. so the information that I received, it says that the Army decides to prematurely award the MHS contract without completing testing. At the end of the limited initial testing conducted in Phase 1, the MHS proposals by Glock and SIG, the only two in the competitive range, had been ranked essentially equally based on limited testing of the technical factors uh, evaluated during that phase. The proposal by SIG Sauer, however, was priced less than Glock's proposal. Pursuant to the requirements of the RFP, the Army was supposed to make an initial award to both Glock and SIG Sauer for a small number of pistols, accessories, and ammunition to be used for purposes of conducting the sustainability, uh, more extensive and comprehensive phase two testing required by section eight of the RFP. It would have cost the army less than $250,000 to order the additional materials needed to complete the second phase of the testing on the Glock's uh, MHS proposal. Uh, price was justifiable intended to be 
uh, least important factor in the selecting a new service pistol within the budget established by the Army for that purpose, according to the terms of the RFP. Nevertheless, based almost exclusively on the price difference between the MHS proposals by Glock Inc. and Six Hour, the Army decided to award the MHS contract to Six Hour without completing the second phase of the testing on a competitive basis to determine which proposal was technically superior. It should be noted that the RFP allowed each offerer to lower the price for their MHS proposals before the start of the second phase of the testing, and purportedly Glock never got that opportunity. So that's kind of what one source, you know, that I'm reading information that I got here, you know, did that actually happen? Uh, What was, you know, I want to know why they did that. Why did they cut it off? Was there something about the Glock that they, that didn't meet their criteria at that point, or I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's going to be something hard to say unless anybody else got anything different. Yeah. Just, well, Glock. I mean, obviously, we all know that Glock um, um, challenged this. You know, they took it to appeals and um, they were denied again. So you know, their their appeal wasn't held up. And at this point, it looks it looks like the Sig is moving forward. The P um, right three twenty is they're moving forward with the P three twenty. So. That seems to be the direction that they're going. So I think, I don't know if Glock had any, any more pills left or not, or, um, but it's my understanding that this is pretty typical that any, any government contract, you always got people appealing and protesting and, and whatnot. And so, well, yeah, the, the appeals attorneys are an entire industry all of themselves. Right. <laughs> well, maybe Marty, if I, if I get a chance, I'm, you know, I mentioned you before, before the show, I'm, I might get a chance to go down to Picatinny Arsenal and visit the folks who, you know, the program manager of Soldier Weapons and the folks that, you know, from RDEC, it's called, that, that oversee all this. Yeah, yeah. And I will certainly try to extract that information from them. You know, obviously, they're going to have an official statement anyways mm-hmm. about all of this. I mean, it's it actually has to be publicly disclosed, you know, per the, our contracting laws. But also, uh, I know here's a key thing that maybe, and Glock probably knows this. Oh, thank you. Uh, is, you know, the word down select that you see being used? Yes, a, a down select is a different type, and I know Nathan probably knows this very well. It's a different, a very, very different process because the I took part in testing for down selects on our sniper night vision and some other products where the Army and the DOD was allowed a lot of latitude, not to change the rules, but to expedite the adoption of something, especially in a time of war. But Absolutely. it's not a complete, it's not a complete replacement, replacement because the Beretta will probably remain in service for quite a while. So it's not a complete one-for-one swap of the guns. It, it the down select out allows you to add to the existing national stock numbered end item. In this case, a, a pistol. Um, so you're going to see a lot of Berettas around for a long time. It's not like 280,000 plus 7,000 are going to instantly appear and end up in holsters in the army and other joint services. And this contract could go far beyond the scope because look what happened with the M9. The Army adapted the M9 years ago, and then all these other people started getting it as well. So yeah. there could be second and third order. Uh, follow on contracts, but I do know that the down select process, I don't know all the, in the weed specifics, but I took part in it as a tester and in, in some conferences with SOCOM. And I know that it is a different process in order to get a new product into the troops hands faster. Yeah. Right. And when you start talking about how or when this eventually becomes a program of record, uh, because right now, you know, we're just talking about the selection process. This isn't actually a, uh, a program of record contracts such as like the M4 or M1 Abrams or things like that. So once it goes into that uh, long-standing, you know, congressionally approved budgeted uh, platform that they decide on, as John was saying, it can, it can definitely turn into different layers that fall under that program. So when we talked about all the different uh, pistol platforms that are in the military across all the different branches, you know, the SIGs and the Glocks and the Berettas and things like that. Um, down the road, as the Berettas are not going away anytime soon, there will be phases in and phases out and different additions to contracting. Um, as you see right now, uh, just because the Army has something doesn't mean everyone in the Army has that. Just because right. someone in the Marines has an M9 doesn't mean the Mu or MARSOC is carrying something else. They make those selections based on their requirements. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, you know. I think a major turning point will occur in terms of seeing who else adopts it and also how far the Army goes because 
is later this year, actually, we're just about to enter into that fiscal quarter, but supposedly the next step was the Army is going to give it a limited issue of the, the uh, XM-17 uh, to some line units. And I know there's an infantry unit, I believe, that was specified. Uh, and they're going to do what's called uh, initial operational testing. So obviously all kinds of feedback's going to come out of that. Because as you probably, you guys know, these line troops are going to beat the crap out of these guns and have plenty to say. But what I'm thinking or guessing is that the other services and, L and other units in the military, to include special forces and so forth, and the units that have some latitude to, to try other product lines, they're going to be looking at that to see what the feedback is yeah. now that it's out of the hands of the R&D people. Well, uh, I think 101st but, Airborne got the first run of them, right? Yeah, but here's, yeah, here's I, my I wasn't point. I was going to it, but that's the word yeah. I got. Here's my point, so. though, <laughs> is that this is the P320 is a relatively new firearm. It's only been around for, what, three years maybe? It, uh, that and, designation, yes, but the technology that built the 320 comes from pre predecessors. But the Glock's been around for what thirty years, you know, pretty well tested. If if they didn't put it through these, you know, the phase two tests, then how do they know, you know, without a shadow of doubt? And I'm not saying that the P320 is not, you know, a worthy worthy gun, but without putting it through those tests and then comparing it side by side with another firearm, whether it's the Glock or the Smith and Wesson or you know whatever it may be. Um, you know how are they? How do they know for sure without doing that? Why? Why are they just picking the P320 and skipping? You know that phase two process. Well, I know one advantage. I've been studying the specs on all these competitors, and I think the one thing that Sig has got a one up on on all of these guys is the three different size interchangeable grip modules. Mm -hmm. You know which two of them are in the R. But all they're doing is changing out a trigger, the trigger housing assembly. You take out the trigger housing and you put right. it in one of the one of the smaller ones. Glock, you can just change out a barrel, you know, and you can right. get, you know, a different caliber, a different I mean, right, but you're also dealing with the entire spectrum of people in the military. So there's all different kinds of hand shapes and sizes right. and mm -hmm. that's what the military is also looking at. It's not just the caliber change, it's also the modularity for the shooter. But the Glock has the uh the different back straps now too, don't they on the Gen 4s? The Gen 4s. But yeah, but honestly, if you compare this, the, the this gives two advantages to Sig over all these other companies cuz you're pretty much stuck with that frame. Uh that you know whether it's a Smith or a Glock or an FN but with this one, you know, the Army could come around later and tell uh, SIG they need different shapes and sizes of that frame that, are, that we did not see now. I'm looking at their website now. But they have the latitude. And, and to change out that polymer, that design, is not too difficult of a process. But they, it gives SIG and the Army the capability to change this thing as we go, um, right. you know, to meet specific needs, particularly with that light mount or any number of things. And the trigger module, I know... That thing looks almost exactly like what, or well, not exactly, but similar to what the SIG Pro pistol, you know, from 15 years ago, that, that was a big selling point that for armors, you go to like a half-day armors course for that pistol, because you could pull that whole module out, and you could put a DAO, you could put a double single, you could even set up potentially a single action only pistol out of this gun. And that's the one thing that at least the Army did put on this gun, is it's got a, you know, manual safety lever on the frame, uh, which is the one thing different than what <laughs> most of the civilian variants have on this gun. So I think it puts SIG and the Army in a position to change and modify this gun, whereas with the Beretta, there's almost nothing you could do to that gun once they got it. Yeah. Right, and one of the things to consider, too, is just because we're fighting primarily in the Middle East right now doesn't mean that we won't find ourselves in the Arctic exactly. where people are wearing big mittens, and that's uh, not that you're going to be able to slip into a Glock frame that easily and definitely not going to be able to retrofit to. I mean, it's going to be the same size no matter what frame they go to. It depends on how modular they make it. Well, again, I mean, they... They haven't made it, so <laughs> how can they base their judgment on that yet? Well, they're also looking down the road. That, that's yeah. part of what all of this testing goes into is not what we're doing necessarily right now, but mm. you know, they have to look long term. They have to figure out the life cycle management of this platform and what it's going to look like 20 years down the road or whatever that service life ends up being. I think it was 10 for this MHS. Not only that, just the yeah, cost it's of 10, that. It's 10 years, yeah, for the gun and five years for the ammo. The cost that's, of the modularity That's only part. what's written into this. That's not if they decide to extend. Right, yeah, they right. can always extend if they wanted to. And also the cost of the modularity it's part. It's the government. Too. They can do whatever the hell they want to. I think Glock, if they, if they end up not getting any traction with this, they're going to get their crack in five or 10 years from now. Yeah, you know, well, again, I mean, they've proven, everybody's going to be watching this. They've proven themselves in other um, arenas with yeah. several highway patrols of uh, nationwide. Uh, even the Philippine National Police, 
uh, just awarded Glock with their, um, I guess, their contract over in the, the Philippines, which it's my understanding that the test that they put the their guns through there is more rigorous than the United States government, which apparently our government didn't put it through any kind of testing other than <laughs> than a uh, uh, an armrest. Well, I don't know. I mean, you got to remember, Marty, the Glock's been used. And I'm not just saying just the Glock. Know. I'm talking about the, the other guns that were in the contest right. as well. It's just that wasn't widely spread and talked about just, just due to mission, you know, mission hey Marty, stuff. how do you think we ended up with a Beretta in the first place? Cost is the cheapest one. <laughs> and, what, and what was listed as the least cost uh, factor? <laughs> cost. There you go. But okay. that's the thing, so you know, if they're going to say, work out. yeah, if cost <laughs> is the least important. But again, as we were talking about earlier, that Beretta probably in the long run ended up costing more because of all the issues and the problems that they had with it. Um, and then when you're talking about all these different components and modularity of this P320, that's a lot of additional accessories there that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, to do that, those that's frames aren't d- just because it's got a frame that you can drop that trigger in. You think they're going to, they're going to, just drop another trigger into that? No, they're going to buy a whole other gun that's already got the trigger in it. That's our government. That's how they work. Well, yes and no. Yes. I, I mean, because I yes. work in supply and logistics also, and I kind of know how that works too. So, yeah. it's, it's, you know. And if you're talking about aftermarket components, then I don't think we should be talking about Glock because you might get your feelings hurt there. <laughs> what are you talking about? They got the most aftermarket <laughs> components of anybody. And plus, and plus, Nate, when you stipple, you can change that grip however you want to, baby. There's a video about that. <laughs> when you get into Dremels and stippling. Oh, my gosh. Well, I was, I was also impressed by it, buried deep in the contract, uh, in the RFP, rather, and in the contract, but uh, is the amount of authorized items and components that have to come with the pistol mm-hmm. and also what the pistol is required. You know, we're, I'm ta- what I'm referring to is that there's actually a designated holster and mag pouch you know, the Safari Land ALS, which I was issued a version of, and I think it's fantastic, honestly. It's, it's frankly the holster that the rest of the industry seems to chase for retention holsters. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the, I don't want to mention other companies, but you know, a lot of them did uh, try to steal that intellectual property and make their own version. But there's a long list in here of other items that are part of the, uh, they call it a, a system component package. Uh, and then, of course, there's the suppressor provision for this contract. And it, they, apparently the suppressor, has to be able to work on the compact and the full size. There's a whole list of stuff that goes with that that nobody ever even thought of when we got the Beretta. You know, they right. they 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 thought ahead on this one. They looked at what the military was asking for, and I can looking down this list, I can see almost everything that they're going to want is actually going to be what's called an AAI or additional authorized item. Like when you mm-hmm. get issued the gun, whether it's right. a cleaning kit or more magazines or, or what have you, it's it's all listed here. And quite a, they even have grip inserts for the ransom rest. So people can actually put these things on a rest and, and check the sites and, and zero the sites. You which, know, I, I think there's a, a required podcast that they have to listen to uh, with that also. I think talking lead. I'm talking lead, I think. It's, it's, it's in there. Sure yeah, it was written in there somewhere, yeah. But you know what, though? I mean, and, and a good point like you brought up earlier is also, like, look at the M4s for modularity, as you was talking about. You know, watching it, the transition, like us in 2004 and five, being a scout unit attached to, th- to 3rd Infantry Division, it was kind of it was kind of one of those things – we had all the good gear, you know, the IR lasers, all the MVGs, all that type of stuff. Uh, back then, it was like the Pack 2s I know that's like ancient Stone Age now. But, um, <laughs> we, you know, we had all that stuff. And when other units would see us, man, y'all got all the cool stuff and everything like that, there's the modularity you're talking about. You know, it's all based right. on mission needs and capabilities and what you're going to be doing uh, in the field. And uh, that type of modularity... You know, looking ahead is, is something they learned from, I think, in previous battles in combat. So I think something that John touched on right there with the uh, AAI, the additional authorized items, when they've gone through and they've put together an RFP package like they did with that much forward thought, there's also a lot of things behind the scenes that most people don't uh, even know about, such as the writing of the field manuals and the technical manuals. Um, TACOM is pretty well backlogged on trying to catch up to all the new technology that's been fielded already. Um, a lot of times you'll find that units are out there with nothing more than an owner's manual from the manufacturer. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they've been playing catch up for a while. So when you look at this RFP, the way that it's written, a lot of that stuff is in the format that TACOM, which is the Tank Automotive and Armament Command up 
uh, over everything that has anything to do with equipment over the military, well, at least on the Army side. Um, they have requirements for how they write those technical manuals and field manuals. So I think they've done a lot of the homework on getting this RFP written in the format that is going to save time on the other side, which is the writing and the, the technical aspects of it that most people never even see. Right. And there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, especially when you start dealing even with TRADOC, uh, right. dealing the teaching and stuff like that. I mean, you you can dig <clears throat> deep, it, even into the training of, of soldiers. you got to look... I, I shouldn't say this, but sometimes you got to look back on, you know, almost a third grade level to kind of, I shouldn't be saying that, I guess, but, you know, to, to train every soldier. I mean, not everybody is going to be special forces or any of that stuff. So they got to have, you know, TMs and 23 MPs and everything else that you can get into and be able to facilitate that with that firearm. Well, here's a prediction for you, Marty, because I've been talking to troops and talking to people who are former troops instructors and a lot of people more like end user feedback versus you know some of our brethren in the gun industry and other places you know you know uh, not present company included but i mean uh you know folks that have been end users of the pistol in the past in the military um and this is what i predict is this i think when guys start getting this new pistol in their hands for one the morale probably will go up a little bit um it's a pistol that more troops had more say in the process versus mm. i know f- about 12 years ago they had the joint combat pistol which was the you know, the first attempt to replace the Beretta yeah. um, and that whole thing just disintegrated and went south and it was ridden with bureaucracy <laughs> and problems. So this is actually an improvement on the last two times the military tried to get a new pistol. But at least I think their morale will go up and you mu- you're probably going to see more troops starting to buy versions of the Peach 320 of their own. They're probably going to go out and practice more on their own because this is a gun you can buy in just about any state. And it's not going to be that expensive. I mean, they're, if you look at the prices on SIG's website, they're obviously kind of high, but they're going to be able to get variations. In fact, I'm hoping that SIG offers a maybe a special purchase for veterans and active duty troops, because that'll get this thing more into circulation, just like the 1911. You know, people were proud of that gun and proud to have it. So, mm-hmm. you know, going back to World War II vets that still own them. But, the, uh, but I also think that this, this process and the actual pistol pick may not make everybody happy. I'm actually reading from one of my article drafts on this, but it's the one gun I think that's come along in history that at least gives us a chance to change it, you know, with its modularity. It's got five different things about this gun that we can change if need be. Um, whereas with the Beretta, there was maybe one other than the grips, and that was you could change the barrel. What, Almost what, nothing do you have the five things listed there? Well, the, yes, the, the barrel, for one, which the SIG is going to have to comply with that anyways, and they've already tested and produced these, but they, you know, the threaded barrel that will work with the suppressor and with all the ammunition that's required, you know, which is a, a testing process in itself. I could send you the whole list, but the, the slide they can change out, the, the you know, they have three different Yeah, just the basics, mod- yeah. So the, the triggers, the barrels, the slides, what else can they change out? Sights, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The sites uh, are very easy. And, and in the contract or in the RFP, it specifies that any suppressor that SIG develops to go with the pistol, if it requires sites to be able to see over the top of the thing, then SIG has to supply those, um, which is no problem for SIG because they've been dealing with sites for many years. Sure. Uh, and from having had to bench rest and zero numerous, when I worked at Homeland Security, we bench rested on a ransom rest every single gun several times a year because of the, our operational needs to be able to get a long shot and so forth. Uh, I could tell you they're pretty darn easy guns to zero and that hold to zero pretty well uh, with the way their newer slides are built. Um, they're a very reliable gun for switching parts out on and still having them function. You know, as many people know, when SIG came out with the 357 SIG, you could literally just convert from 40 to 357 with a barrel swap. And if anything, this gun is going to have all those advantages, if not more, because there's parts of Almost every gun that SIG's built incorporated into this gun. It's like they're, it's all but, their lessons learned. But you know they what they, they can't do with it, John? What's that? They can't put it into a micro Roni. <laughs> well, we're going to have to call Mikey Hartman. And you know, to there's on. a whole other <laughs> level of modularity they've not even thought about. You know, turning, right. turning their handgun <laughs> into um, a sub gun, you know, submachine gun. You got it. You, there's a whole radio show right there. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> lethality and accuracy you just you know quadrupled so can you imagine having a microroni with a sig p320 or mark 17 with suppressor on it oh you know mikey's gonna make one now compatible for the p320 if they do that i will be getting one for you sure. know he's going to he has to 
It's there's money well, to be made is, there. Mikey's going to jump all yeah. over that. And speaking of speaking of Mikey, you, you know, you're talking about the implementation of the P320. You remember that class that we took uh, with him, and they were talking about how you know when he was implementing the Tavor with the uh, Israeli Defense Forces, they were doing it with just the new troops that were coming in. The old guys didn't get them because they didn't want to have to spend the time and the effort to try to retrain an old dog new tricks. You know. So do you think right. you think our military is gonna is gonna do it that way? Well, I know at least with the Israelis, I think you might remember to explain it. Each each brigade in the IDF has a different rifle, and it's almost like a territorial thing to them. That's why they have so many different rifles in that military: Gleals, you know, the the Tavor uh, and, and um, ARs, and so forth. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think I, here's the thing: our military is a lot bigger. We got a lot more money, and also we got the Congress behind this. So if anybody's got any complaints about this gun, it Honestly, especially now with social media and people contacting elected officials or leaking things, it word will get out on all of this. And mm. it, it, the, I think in the end run, it's going to be better for the troops. That's really, since I began whining about this pistol in the early 90s, that's really all I cared about. I, and it's why I wrote to the Army and complained about it. To It used to be called the JSAP program, but now it's the uh, program Soldier Weapons. And then I wrote to Smith & Wesson and asked them, why didn't you guys win the pistol contract? I'm disappointed. But, you know, I'm a happy camper now because we've got, we're a lot better off than we were before. Right, right. So. Well, and you yeah, made a comment the- also about, you know, wouldn't it have been better if they had chose, had picked, a, you know, American-made firearm? Well, my personal bias and having worked for one of the American companies, you know, Smith & Wesson, I, I, I would have loved to see an enhanced version of the M&P be this pistol, but the one advantage SIG's got is those interchangeable grip modules. You know, you can change the whole bottom half of the gun out. But, yeah, I would have rather seen SIG or Smith & Wesson, or I'm sorry, Smith & Wesson or Ruger, partly because just knowing from the inside that mm-hmm. those two companies are huge and could tool up to quickly crank these guns out, where a lot of these other companies, I don't know if you've ever walked around someone, but they're pretty darn small, especially now that they've gone to CNC machining. They are... Square footage-wise, factories, it's shocking to people yeah. when they visit. I didn't think Ruger was in the running, were they? They weren't even one of the 12, were they? No, but in honesty, I I checked out the, the Ruger, the, the All-American that they came out with, and I personally like it. I know people start shooting arrows at me for saying that, but and I'm just <laughs> thinking of what a troop needs and wants, you yeah, know? Yep. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I care about. I, you know, I work for two different gun companies, and I don't have you know blind loyalty to either one of the two. And when I was an instructor, we had to be impartial because we had to teach every type of gun. We had to know the system of operation and the best possible technique on any gun, no matter what. Because, you know, you get a cop, if he's issued that messed up Beretta, you can't say that's a messed up gun. You can't send a guy back to duty thinking that. You know, you got to build their confidence in their equipment. Mm. So there's a way to, for lack of a better term, there's a way to trick anybody into being able to shoot just about any gun well, right? But why should we put that on our troops? Why not give them a gun that's easy to shoot and it's always going to work? And then, as one of our, our fellow interviewees here said, you know, it's got to be modular, so let the troop decide how they're going to configure the gun for the mission. So yeah. I'm, I'm more happy than anything, you know. So. I just look. I mean, I work for SIG, but it's nice to see them win. But I, it, there's about eight different manufacturers I think would have been great for this. Yeah, but when you say modular, I mean the Glock's one of the most modular handguns there is on the market today. Right. Um. So I mean, it's got <laughs> different. It's, it's got different aspects of modularity versus you know the modularity that you're talking about that this the P320 has. But the 320 has two distinct advantages over any Glock, and that's the uh, um, the interchangeable grips. You know, you completely can change the design of the lower half of the gun if needed. You know, there's already three available, and the Army, I think, is buying two. But what's but the, the difference? Uh, what's the difference? Is it the thickness? Is it the... Uh, what's the difference the in the grip? Frame. You can change the entire frame out. So you can go from a, a full size to a mid size to a subcompact. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, and the difference is the length of the actual dust cover on the, SIG calls it an interchangeable grip module, but the dust covers on the large, uh, medium, and small are all different lengths, and the grips are different length as well. Um, you can still use the full-size mags in the compact or small grip module, but there's so, a little extender like you see so on when a they guns. Issue, so when they issue this, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when they issue this P320, is everybody going to get all of those components each person yeah, the, most of the troops are going to get the full size grip <clears throat> they're going to have the ability to switch to the smaller grip if they need it right then sig is going to issue a certain smaller quantity i think it's seven or eight thousand of just the compact which is the shorter slide the shorter barrel and the smaller grip module but again you can buy themselves or they're just issuing the full size with that that modular piece now the way i read it is that the 
the, the full size, they'll have the ability to modularly change some of these components out um, and with or without a suppressor. And then there's going to be the separate compact, of which there's only about 7,000 going to be issued and maybe more, who knows, for like CID and counterintelligence and so mm-hmm. forth. But And also for troops that have smaller hands, like women and a lot of people who never had this opportunity before. I've seen female troops that literally could not get their index finger all the way onto the trigger of the Beretta previously. Yeah. But this newer module has a shorter trigger web distance, you know, from the uh, mm-hmm. from the web of your hand to the shoe of the trigger. So this automatically is an advantage because not to mention that the army but that, how's that different than issuing them a, a glock 19 or a glock it, 23 because on the glock you have removable <coughs> inserts that go into the existing frame in this case you're you can change the entire frame the entire frame in one and without tools but what, was, but what you're saying is they're just going to automatically be issued that that size or that frame right but right. they'll have the ability to use the other sizes if they need to like, for instance, if their hand doesn't fit the gun, uh, which is prevalent, I think, in many cases. Uh, it, this is an easier to reach yeah. trigger than the Beretta. The I guess I, it's hard for me to comprehend this because I've not seen, I guess, the frames for the P320. So I would need when to see those. There, you're going to be the first to see the results of all this. But <laughs> okay. I mean, it's been written about widely. But just to answer your question, the other part of it is. I'm just saying Glock's got three different sizes of, of handguns right now. So, I mean. Okay. What's not modular about that? And then the ability to no. change out a barrel to get a different caliber. You can change out different magazines to get different. Um, um, uh, this one, this one actually. You can does change a lot out back straps to get different grips. Th- this gives you a lot more interchangeability by far. And the, yeah. the other half of that is the uh, the trigger group, which they call a striker fired interchangeable trigger group. You know, the one the Army's buying. You know, which is the same. Uh, you know, it's a double action only, basically, or a version of that. Mm-hmm. But with uh, it's a DAO with a manual safety, which is odd, but that's what the military wants. And I can see there's some reasons for having that. Yeah. Um, and it's a stri- this is the first time the military, for a general purpose pistol, is is purchased a striker fired gun. Mm-hmm. I think part there's of the other thing that you're talking about is you can change guns, but you're talking about a different model number. So when you talk about going from a Glock 19 to one of the other models, just because the grip is different, it's a completely different gun. But the SIG is going to be the same model no matter what grip right. you put on it. Right. And the with this this trigger group, you know, the Army's buying what they spec, but this also gives the troops the capability. Um, if there are some units do want a single action only pistol, where they uh, which that that could be done because I've seen that done when they had an earlier pistol that SIG built. But this allows them also. This is one of the first military pistols ever. You don't need tools to work on this gun. They're the only, there's, and now you don't even need a screwdriver now because you don't need a screwdriver to take the grips off like the previous two models, you know, 1911 M9. But you can take this whole gun apart and put it back together, minus the sights, without any tools. And that's, that's a good thing, I think. And if, and if something goes wrong with the trigger group or with the frame, like say the frame gets a little bit melted, you know, if the Beretta got, if your grip got crushed or something on a Beretta or, or you know, some kind of damage like a vehicle rollover or something, the gun is gone. With this thing, you can replace the part without tools, and they can do that in the field. So this is going to dramatically you simplify. Can do that with a there. Glock too, right? But you can't interchange trigger groups or on all on the Glock, and you got to use tools to do it. I got to see but it. I guess can, I just I have to physically this, see uh, it. When you when you slide <laughs> off the gun, you can literally with one motion take the entire trigger mechanism out of the gun in one piece. All the pieces come out. Uh, the trigger and everything. The only thing that's left down in there that you can mess with is the magazine release. Hmm. So from an armors, I, I've been to the SIG armor school like three times. I used to have to go through it like once a year when I worked there. Um, and it's, those guns are pretty simple as it is, just like the Glock. Yeah. But this is even simpler than anything I've ever seen. More cost so. effective. Well, time will tell whether it's more cost effective or not. We'll see. Well, yeah, there you go, because we don't know yeah. what's going to happen. Right. True. So uh, again, you know, I think the fact that they didn't put it through the full test um, you know, kind of makes me skeptical. I, now I got nothing against Sig. I like Sigs. You know, I've got a, a P226. I love it. I like the M11A1s. Is that what they're called? Yeah, M11A1. Yeah, those are sweet pistols. Yeah, I love those too. Uh, they're 1911s that they have. You know, I like you know their 45s. The Michelles and stuff like that. Yeah, Max Michelle. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm not busting on Sig at all. I just I want to make sure that our troops are getting you know a reliable. <clears throat> good gun you know something that's going to be battle tested battle worn hold up you know when their life depends on it when our lives depend on it um 
and like you said, you know, it, it's a morale thing too. I think just the fact that they're getting a whole new a gun platform, I don't, I don't think it matter which gun they picked. You know, I think, I think everybody would have been excited about it in our military. I think the morale would have gone up no matter what. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to see how this turns out. I want it to work. You know, I, now that they've picked it, you know, um, I'm going to get behind it a hundred percent and, you know, help them out. But at the same time, you know, if there's still a chance that they can get a Glock in there, I'm, I'm a Glock guy, obviously. <laughs> well, I'm going to put it another way. All right. Let me put it another way. I worked there for three years and I made it a point to, to issue myself one of every SIG that SIG made at the time mm-hmm. in every caliber and every type. And I also had to teach right hand and left hand. But during the three years, I went through every different model and variation of every model that SIG had every caliber. It's about 30 guns. And I, you know, I would holster up and like for a week at a time or two weeks, I would teach with and use those. And I personally feel this P320 military variant, I would pick that over anything that I taught with. And yeah. I've got some favorites and I got my favorite calibers and stuff. But I actually like this gun for a number of reasons better, especially if, not just in general for like concealed carry or for cops, but especially for military purposes, you know, having been a former troop. Yeah. You know, and it does something. Well, I know how thorough and uh, meticulous you are. And if you say it's a good gun, then I, you know, I obviously would take your word for it. But I, I, I still, I still gotta, I still gotta get some hands on with it, with this modularity. Yeah. I'm not stoled on the modularity uh, benefit, um, other than the track. I can see the benefit of the trigger. You know, all one piece, pop it out, pop it in. But as far as those, the grips that you're talking about, the different frames, I'm not, I'm not seeing that yet. So I've gotta, I gotta get sold hey, on that part. <clears throat> hey John, I the, I the judge. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't had a 320 in my hands. I've only seen the pictures of them. Does that come with a manual safety? external safety the new the military version does yes okay and i think that's also going to be a major player with how i understand the military's safety program that mm -hmm. you know without i'm not in love with an external manual safety personally but i know the military that's Mm -hmm. where they lean most of the time and that's what i saw with a lot of the glocks that were fielded overseas um that the military specifically the army big army uh generally frowned on pistols that did not have an external manual safety yeah they believe in that safety for sure here's well, your here's your external safety right here well, <laughs> here's the good news yeah, if you look works at in hollywood safety, yeah it does but if you look at the safety on the model you know the tan ones that the army tested it's it's a good ergonomic design it it, cl- it fits very close to the gun and is snag free and it's really for all practical purposes it's out of the way um i know that for a fact that a lot of troops because it's basically a dao type action they're not even going to, they'll probably have the safety down all the time. A lot of right. units will. They're not going to, because that, as you guys know, that's a training issue right there. Is just like with a 1911 or a bearing high power mm-hmm. is no, when you draw that thing from the holster at one point, you got to, you know, actuate the safety. So that's a training issue there that could screw people up. But I think a lot of units are going to just keep that safety lever down, you know, a lot of soft units and so forth. It's not even an issue. I, I can see why. And I know of certain situations that you would want a safety, maybe, um, it, so, it, so all the I'm thousands. thinking about the part of the military that runs around in PT belts. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's exactly it right there, the PT belt mentality. Right. So yeah. I'm thinking of all the thousands and thousands of aftermarket accessories that there are for a Glock. I've never seen a s- an ex- what, what do you talk? What do we talk about? We're keeping that on the DL because we're going to go into manufacturing on that one as so soon as we get the Did you patent here. that yet? Did you go ahead and trademark that for us? And I've been so busy. Okay. I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so Marty, the, the other t- part that you were talking about, you mentioned uh-huh. how long the, uh, how long it's going to take for this pistol to get, uh, implemented. Yeah. Implemented into, and, and it's not going to be a one for one swap with all the M nines. Think about the M 16, a two. There are still units that are using the M 16, a two. Right. Even though we've switched long, long ago over to the M4, mm. they're still in use, and I would be willing to bet that there will still be 1911s and and M9s that are going to still be in the system somewhere, whether it's in the reserves or or some other type of component, uh, and still be using that weapon. It's like you said, it's not going to be a one for one swap. So yeah. Initially, well, it's going to be those. It'll take time. Small units that are that are begging for this pistol, and then eventually, it's going to spread throughout the rest of the services. 
And realistically, you've got the M2 heavy barreled machine gun that's seen service since it was fielded in 1921. Oh, yeah. Um, to the point where we even pull it off. Of, we pulled it off of aircraft after in the 50s and turned them into ground mounted versions. Uh, we're still running around with the 1911-45 pistols. So or because we have the best armors in the world. Well, I mean, we're talking hundred year old designs, hundred fifty year old designs that are still still working, still in, in service. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as look far at as programs go, I don't see this being an overnight uh, change, and no, I, don't I don't see don't it either. being no. to scale right out out the gate. Mm-mm. It took a while to get the non head space and time and M 2s out finally. I well, mentioned. I know when uh, the I know back in the eighties when we were switching over the M sixteen A two. I was in an active duty in the infantry in one of the lowest priority units in the Army. We had A2s around 1988. I went in the National Guard that year in a Special Forces unit, and we had the A1s. You know, we, you, know you would think we'd have the newer thing, but uh, it took a long time to get those. At one point, we had A1s, A2s, and M4 A1s and M4s. We had four different rifles circulating <laughs> around combat arms in the Army there. Right. And, and coming from that same mentality, uh, I went through, I think, three uniform changes when I came in, or by the time I got out. And when I first came in, we still had, uh, and this was a training unit, so it wasn't Army-wide, but we still had M60 machine guns. Uh, we had chocolate chip, you know, uh, uniforms, the DCUs with the brown marks on them. And we also yeah. had uh, Pricks PRC-77 radios when... You know, everyone else was getting Singar's radios. So that kind of gives you an idea that just because, and we're, and this is in the Army. This isn't, oh, hand-me-downs to the Marine Corps because the Army's done with it yet. We still have this, and this was active duty. This wasn't even National Guard or Reserve. Right. Well, one, one thing I know that is different now, I got to see this. I actually ended up in Afghanistan uh, less than a year from 9-11. So I was there for the first anniversary, and then again on the 10th anniversary. And I was always keeping track of the gear and, you know, what units got what and, and how fast, but something that changed since 9-11, they have this thing called rapid fielding initiative, which means yep. whoever goes, whoever's going into the box, into the war zone, is like first in line to get anything that's new. So whether it was the new Mitch helmets, the Camelbacks, the M240 machine gun, they would actually push those units to, the, actually took part in a selection process for that, uh, representing my unit, where we got to nominate the products. But, you know, the EOTech, all this stuff, um, and they have been a lot better, the Army Material Command and all these different commands that buy all this stuff, they've been a lot better about making sure these units get whatever's the latest and greatest, the, the night vision, the late. I mean, it's actually been a revolution in our military. Body armor. Yeah, I was part of the mm-hmm. interceptor body armor uh, part of the RFI, so I, I know exactly what you're talking about and how that worked oh, out. Yeah. Them old IBAs. Oh. So perhaps with this pistol contract, we'll see – uh, more rapid fielding, you know, to meet the troops' needs. I mean, we've got less troops now by far overseas than we did in, like, 2007 and so forth, and we're at the height of the war. Uh, I think when I was in, the last time I was in Afghanistan, we had, uh, it was right before the, the, the downsizing, was, uh, we had 101,000 U.S. and about 50,000 NATO. But now we're, I think, down around 10,000 or something. So, you know, you got less troops over in the box. But either way, I'd, they've gotten this down to a science now, being able to get this new equipment out pretty quickly. And as far as it comes down to... Uh, why they didn't initiate the second phase or, or the further testing? Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of this stuff has gotten to be such a science that just because what you see on the table uh, isn't all that is going on, so a lot of that testing requirement could have been done in other fashions outside of this MHS. Well, again, uh, it, it could have been, and we're just speculating at this point. So, I mean, I don't right exactly. I, you know, I don't I don't know. So, I would like to get some some more information and maybe. Uh, as John was talking about, he's going to he's gonna be going to some of these, these manufacturers and see them in person and interview them. Maybe we could do a uh, you know, follow-up and see what you, what you discover. Yeah, also, if we could, you know, if you'd like, we could put the word out by social media before that trip, solicit from you know, gun media guys and troops what questions they want asked that we could get answered on the show next time. Okay, yeah. Do, and we, live in a, we live in the technology world now where they're not going to be able to hide – uh, corruption in the process for the selection right, right. Uh, like they used to be able to as well. So, I mean, the, the days of $20,000 hammers and $30,000 toilet seats and nobody knows about it, uh, that's that's gone quite a, quite a ways away from what we have now when it comes to the procurement process. Yeah. Okay. So do we, uh, any final thoughts? We want to, was there anything else that we needed to, to hit on? I think we hit the major things. Um, I think we just left more questions than we answered, but 
Um, does anybody have anything else that they wanted to cover to make sure that we got out there? I, I think the military could do much worse than what they're already considering oh, with the three yeah, with the yeah. three twenty series. And that's a fact. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of, of of really bad choices we could have made, but I think they crossed enough T's and dotted enough I's to at least make sure that our our troops and LE are getting a very good pistol. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I have my top ten list, Marty. Your top ten uh, list. I got a, a top 10 list of things that we should look ahead for with this pistol contract. Okay. So let's you know, do that. So or, looking forward, um, we'll start with you. What, uh, what do we need to be looking for? The number one is once the first order of the pistols that are delivered to the units, you know, that's supposed to happen in this pistol quarter that we're going into, which ends October one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so supposedly some infantry and other units are going to deliver, accept delivery and start shooting and testing. You know, it, it's basically where they go to the range, but they're going to have, military procurement people with them uh, during this next phase. And I think we'll be watching that and also making sure, you know, to see that SIG does get this right and can tool up and produce this large number of pistols in the time frame that they're required to. The, the second thing is it'll be curious to see this is the first striker-fired gun as a general issue in the military. I mean, the, the Glock's out there in a few units, like Army Special Forces has a few. Uh, but this will be the first time to see a striker fire gun in uniform troops hands you know widespread especially going to this type of combat zone you know not a hammer fired gun and to see what you know as you guys know striker fired guns have had a history with light hits and other issues Mm -hmm. that can happen um not saying that there would be any problem with sig the other thing we're going to see is an explosion of both government off the shelf commercial off the shelf and aftermarket orders by units for all the stuff the contract doesn't include which at least this one includes things like holsters and other gear and but these guys are obviously going to be authorized, like they have been since 9-11, to start ordering more. And, I, and So there's going to be a lot of business for companies to equip these 580,000 uh, or 280,000 pistols uh, as well, um, as well as the Army buying more of what they need. We're also going to see feedback from the troops on the gun, and I've already got my people planted out there, and I'm, I'm asking to tell me the truth. Uh, we may see some changes with the gun, whether the Army decrees it and tells SIG, or SIG may come up with some improvements. Uh, also a big one is the suppressors and how that's going to roll out and who's going to get them and how those work um, and how SIG does with that because that's a newer part of their their product line. Um, you're going to see other services maybe ordering it and also other, you know, the big thing that SIG and others benefit from and Glock does especially is foreign military sales. You know, anytime you get a national stock number on something, several different organizations in our government facilitate sales to other countries, you know, from U.S. manufacturers. So you may see a lot of other countries or police forces ordering it because of the success or not in our military. Um, the other thing is you may see an effect on the rest of the market, too. Um, you know, whether it's people buying personal purchase because, hey, I got the Army, the gun, you know, the Mark 17. Well, I mean, um, let's be honest. I, that's I, that's one of the biggest reasons why these companies want to get the government contracts because, I mean, they bid them so low to begin with. Um, they know that the, uh, the you know, civilian market is really their big target. I know the second that people found out the 320 was going to be the military's pistol or the army's pistol, so to speak, the sales went went crazy on the 320. And look at all the if you look at Sig's website, they've got all these other versions now for competition and with all kinds of stuff on exactly. the which I would love to get uh, my hands on to try. By the way, <laughs> those are. Uh, but I also think too, my prediction. I don't know if it'll happen or not. But you may see the military or the troops saying they want some some differences specs on those grip modules. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a lot easier to change than changing an aluminum or steel frame on a gun, as Nathan, I know, as a manufacturer knows. But that you may see that down the road. They may want something different with those grips. They're going to want easy enough. They're going to want one that says Glock on it. <laughs> I didn't really say that. The other one is that they're going to have an armor course just for this gun to show uh, how they can which put, the, be a put it good in thing a Glock for gun media guys to go to. Yeah, you know, that'd be Sig cool. Is, yeah. That's one of the best things I'll tell you from having worked there that SIG does is their armors course. I know people that went to it as well as H and case just to see how an armors course is run. Um, they used to send us to these in the military, um, not so much to learn just that product line, but to see how, you know, what they recommend for processes. And the last prediction, number 10 is maybe, and I'm going to suggest it to SIG anyways, uh, my contact that I've been supplied with there, they really need to offer a discount program for this pistol. So vets, troops, and anybody else, that, you know, they got a reason for it. Uh, can get oh, yeah. a, get this gun at a decent price because that will be money in the bank for them if it is a successful pistol to ge- keep this thing in the system. Well, I thought they already yeah. had that in place, though. On that thought, John, I would actually add uh, three 
tips or advice for SIG, um, I mean, and I'm just a guy, so they can take it or leave it. Um, but the first thing I would do is on, on that note, uh, offer a or tool up to be able to offer a custom version of that and put out special editions of that gun. Uh, you'll see that a lot with uh, military units that they will have a, you know, first infantry division version of that or, you know, a, a second MARSOC or I don't even know the military units, but they will have special versions of the gun and they'll have, you know, uh, engravings and, you know, gold plated triggers and all kinds of crazy stuff. They did that with uh, the 1911s. They did that with the M9 Berettas. And that is a huge secondary market that they can tap into. Um, and then two other points of advice. One would be to ramp up their uh, factory certification armors courses that you were talking about, because on the other side of the house, not just DOD, but you have Department of State contracts that require that uh, for their armors that go over on WPS and DAV con contracts um, to where they have to uh. have factory certifications for those. Um, and then, you know, the, the last point that I would make to that is they should really, really, really reconsider their model number because the military already has an M320 and it's a grenade launcher. So that's going <laughs> to be a point of confusion for the military because if you don't keep it simple for them out the gate, then things get crazy later on. What's going to be the so, M17? If they if they go with that designation, right? I'm seeing everybody and their mother, you know, depending on who's writing the story with different information so okay. i want to make sure that that's yeah right. i agree i think that sig to simplify it on their website it should just say m17 you know yep. yeah or yeah. something yeah. like that the, M the xm17 program but that doesn't necessarily mean what it's going to be accepted in kind of like what we saw with the f23 and f22s that were going through their testing and i know that was based yeah. on the selection of which one they chose well i know definitely with the uh pistol coming in i definitely want to use my gi bill to go to their armors course to kind of get more knowledge of the firearm myself so yeah so um ken yes sir any final thoughts i uh, i think you guys covered pretty much all of it and as far as the as far as the old guy uh <laughs> of the group uh i would i have never used a striker fire pistol so i i can't even speak to that Nate, uh, it you got to correct him on that. Interesting for me to be able to uh, to test out something along that lines, or or even get one of my own if I if I enjoy shooting something like that. I mean, I carry a Smith and Wesson 45, so I, I carry that because that's what I'm comfortable with. But that doesn't mean that I won't be comfortable with something like this. We upgraded him from a single action peacemaker last year. <laughs> Casey, any <laughs> Casey, any final thoughts? I, no, I'm just glad to see a good just change. Okay, all right. And guys, just because the military is adopting this firearm doesn't mean you can't, you can't still go out and buy a Glock. <laughs> so. I, I have Glocks. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to not shoot my Glocks. And that's yeah, what my I'm, other oh, my other know. pistol is a P38. So and that's what I shoot in competition. Unless this new Sig is kind of cool. So kind of excited to see that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think we covered a whole lot. Uh, in this episode, we're we're knocking on two hours here, so um, we might have information overload for our lead heads, but I think it was all uh, very, um, very good information, very constructive. Uh, other than me, I think I might have been a little, showed a little bias, didn't I? Didn't mean to. Not I hope you do the same thing when we're talking about AR-15s with your uh, AR-15 manufacturing sponsor. You, you know I will. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, uh, real quick, let's talk about how everybody can get in touch with everybody here. So, John, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, talk about uh, uh, everything you got going on real quick. I will post a link that connects with your page, but uh, I'm on Twitter. At, it's at JTF Peterson, all lowercase. Same as on Instagram, same as all my social media, but I'm definitely on Facebook under my full name. It's John Milton Peterson, and uh, it's got my ugly bug on there. But like I said, I'll connect on to your Facebook. So Okay, sounds good. Nate, everybody knows Frontier Tactical. Go See, ahead. I'd and, like uh, to get the questions that people want to ask, you know, the sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a social media post for that, and the Leadheads can yeah. go and, and post their, their questions for when you're doing your, your tours of specific answers they'd like you to get. Yeah, that's definitely the important part of investigative journalism is having the right questions asked. So, yeah, if we can get those questions to John. I think that's probably going to help him best get yeah. the information that everyone is looking for. Absolutely. They'll probably know before I even get there, I used to work there, so it's not going to be as easy for them to slip the wool over my eyes or whatever. Uh, and the same with the Army folks from the uh, program uh, Soldier Weapons. 
to continue Arsenal. I've had dealings with them all through the 90s and 2000s, so you know, at least I can speak their lingo, and it's not like just some amateur guy walking in there, you know, asking questions like a reporter. Uh, I should be able to get, you know, maybe get a little bit more information. that will help people out with what they want to know. Yeah, well, Marty uh, can sell you a fake mustache if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Nate, Frontier Tactical. Sir. <laughs> Uh, FrontierTactical.com. We're all over social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all over the place. So just put in Frontier Tactical, you will find us. And we are very responsive to messages of any kind. And talk about your new line of ARs, the FT series. Sure. So uh, we have kind of put a lot of design and engineering into uh, the entire AR-15's platform um, and what it takes to make it completely modular and multiple caliber. Um, a lot of people just stamp multi-cal on the lower. There's more to it than that. All of our FT series rifles and pistols come from the factory ready to go 100% multiple caliber. And that means enlarged ejection ports so that you can go all the way up to 50 Beowulf, um, all the way down to 17 Remington is what we've tested so far. Um, so literally changing the game, so to speak, when it comes to the AR platform and what you know. And it doesn't have to be a single caliber rifle anymore. Just changing barrels, bolts, and magazines, and going through over ninety calibers. Very cool. Makes great Father's Day gift. Does. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Casey, real quick, what you got coming up competition wise? Uh, well, competition wise, I'm just now getting back into the game of it after we had our young and so. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you, thank you. I'm baby, excited. Baby boys at home. Yep, little boys at home. Uh, stayed in the NICU for over over a month. So I mean, we're. We're definitely NICU graduates. I'll give you that. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, I, I plan on getting back into the game pretty heavy. Uh, I'm going to try to get into some uh, series matches and stuff like that back in there, especially like the Pro-Am coming up uh, in August. You going like to be doing some uh, PCC? Well, I'm hoping Nordic sends me the PCC. Uh, I know they got them in the works, putting the competition magwells that people had seen some pictures of on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and from what I understand, that's what we're going to be using. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing that because there's really high remarks about that and people love them. So, uh, but I'm, you know, I, I can't wait. So that's a, that's a biggie for me. And I, and I enjoy the, uh, NC 15s and stuff like that, that Nordic sent me. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I know the, uh, 308, I can't wait to get my hands on one of those either. So I got one. <laughs> I, yeah. Don't rub it in. <laughs> don't rub it in. All right, guys. Uh, so we're running low on time here, but I do want to thank our other sponsors of the show. My biased, uh, Glock, the official carry of left hand of talking lead. Uh, that's right. I rock the Glock 23, the Glock 27. Love them. I'm a 40 cal guy. What do you think about that, John? 40 cal. Yes. Actually, one of my three carry guns is a Glock 23. It was one of the first, like, few thousand made. Uh, you know, I bought it 20 something years ago, like 1993, but no, I've got one, you know, it's got like nine modifications on it, but I, yeah. that's one of my carry guns. And I, when I was at Smith and Sig, I taught quite a bit with the 40 and I, that's still, that's one of my three calibers I carry. So Very I'm cool. good with it, man. But think of it this way. The 40, finally, another one of the 40 first guy. calibers designed for shooting bad guys at close range. Right. There you go. Absolutely. I mean, it's a good caliber and it's put down a lot of bad guys over the years. So good to go. Yeah, it has. Very good. All right, that does it. John, thank you so much for your time. I know you put a lot of work into uh, this episode, um, more than I really wanted you to, but, man, um, I'm looking forward to our follow-up. Oh, yeah. Glad to do it, man. Yeah. Nate, thank you. Appreciate everything you do for us here at uh, Talking Lead, and we're looking forward to uh, our continued partnership. Absolutely. We appreciate you having us on the show, and sorry Mike wasn't able to get the technological side worked out Well, maybe tonight. we can get Mike down on uh, on part two. We might be able to get him in on that. And uh, Ken, looking forward to uh, sharing more smelly rooms with you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> CG3G, my brother. Appreciate it. it. No problem. Well, you and I will be uh, hitting some competitions here soon, especially Rock Castle coming definitely. up. Definitely, definitely. Good place to go shoot, by the way. It Nobody's is. ever been there. I'd go check it and out. And let him shoot. shoot that SIG so he can get over his Glock infatuation. Well, that was something well, I, I was going to say. Well, go ahead. That's what I want to do. I absolutely. If I can get... Well, see, I was talking to... Uh, I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. Patrick Franks. I was talking to him about it because he's got one. Shoots for the USAMU. And, uh, man, I, I'm really wanting to try that thing. Like, Casey, very bad. you'll get to try one, so don't worry about it. <laughs> John, is SIG, is SIG going to Big 3? <laughs> you know, last time they canceled... I will find out. I'm going to ask. Because oh, that's a good that would be a, a great opportunity for us to get hands-on with that bad boy. 
We need to Marty bring like. Marty would be happier with a with a P two thirty eight rather than a, something else. Why is that? It's more your size. It's more my size. What's that mean? Have you seen these guy. mitts? <laughs> we actually just saw Sig down at Sofic. I got uh, elf pretty, hands. Pretty big demonstration down there. It was pretty good. Oh yeah, with the P three twenty. Uh, and, and the MPX and MCX and, and a bunch of the other stuff that they were uh, I got porting the SoFit community with. All right, Leadheads, that does it for another episode of the Talking Lead Show. As always, Leadheads, keep your loved ones close. And, and your, your firearms, firearms closer. closer. Oh, baby, like a choir. Love that. <laughs> that was perfect.